Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversation isn't so much a conversation as a long versation as I speak with Vocal Distance and Dave the Distributist about the topic of No Enemies to the Right, which derives from an article written by Charles Haywood in response to a dust-up where a headmaster of a Christian school was caught posting certain contentious beliefs from a right-wing persuasion online and was summarily fired along with anyone associated with him from that Christian school. And that cancellation campaign was responded to by ideas about discourse and argumentation on the right wing. However, Wokel's contention is that no enemies to the right in practice means that there is no policing of the boundaries of what is acceptable within right wing and center right thought. And so Dave and Wokel go at it extensively on this and other related topics. I don't know personally if the center-right or Enlightenment liberals and the neo-reactionaries can ever really get along in a political sense, but I do see that they have a common enemy that they need to band together in order to stymie, being the woke left, and so this conversation I think is important to map the margins between the center-right Enlightenmentals and the neo-reactionary or dissident right groups. To learn more about the specifics of No Enemies to the Right or Netter, I will link in the description more articles for you to catch up on and definitely do follow Dave and Wokel on Twitter and other social media platforms, which will also be linked in the description. Without further ado, here is Wokel and the Distributist. Dave, do you have a position? Do you, do you like, are you like a dark romantic or a, a deep rightist or dissident right uh well i i call myself a dissident right but that's an uncool title because these things change every three years yeah uh, i don't know i mean people call me neo reactionary i'm fine with that uh, okay i i'm I'm a, I'm a skeptic of the enlightenment and i i am on the right wing and that makes me at odds with the mainstream right and mm -hmm. the idw and the ideas that people circulate in these circles tend to be you know they tend to be there's a wide diversity but there's a lot of standard opinions that separate us from the rest of most mainstream thoughts so i'm sure that will come up during this conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and vocal idw classical liberal where are you at right now well that's a great question um <clears throat> So I would still call, broadly call myself an Enlightenment liberal, but not Enlightenment maybe in the way that it's typically understood, where, where I think that the Enlightenment, uh, Enlightenment liberalism has the, the sort of leftist wing of the Enlightenment liberalism opened the door to the postmodern wing. And that's a serious problem, but I and I think that the Enlightenment project needs to be needs updating. But I I have not rejected. I don't think I've rejected some of the fundamental tenets of of Enlightenment liberalism, mm -hmm. reason, dem democracy as understood, not in the way that the kind of critical Marxists understand democracy. Um, that there is a fundamental human nature, that there is objective truth. Um, yeah, so I, I, I broadly find myself there. But that's not to say that I, uh, I accept the, the positions of the neoconservatives, because I don't. No, that, that's fair enough, obviously. I, I think, I know you've talked to R.N. McIntyre, and the position is, is broadly, when it comes to liberalism, that, I mean, we all think these things are nice to have, everyone likes liberty, but what people always point to, what we always point to, is that th these ideas were predicated on on certain circumstances that were you know, they were they were active at a certain historical period of human time, and now all of those circumstances, all of those preconditions, have now been evaporated, and you know we're operating these enlightenment ideas in social and cultural circumstances that the people who originally thought them up would think were crazy 
and would think would be totally inappropriate uh, to to use. So, I mean, that's our position, and that's uh, uh, all my position, I should say. But you know, I'm just copying this from other authors. When you, when you when you say that, are you talking about in terms of policy or in terms of first principles? Because I don't think that you. I, I would not be willing to say that objective truth is the kind of thing that's historically located and is contingent on historical circumstances. I think statements are true or false based on whether or not they describe reality accurately. So are you going to say... If well, what, can you give me a first false, principle? Like, I mean, I, I, you know, can you, I, I, can you give me a first principle you're thinking of here? A statement is true or false. Here's a first principle. A statement no, is I, true I know or what false I know what it's, whether or not it thinks it is. I know what a first principle is. I'm mean, I believe in objective truth. I'm religious. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what, what we usually consider liberalism or liberty or ordered liberty. These are a set of pol government policies. These are a set. This is a way of oh, organizing okay. government. Uh, organizing government, I don't think, is a first principle. I don't think that there right. was one ideal okay. form of government that was created at the beginning of time. I think that certain right. governments are appropriate for certain periods of history. And I think republicanism okay. and democracy require certain things. And that's what I'm saying. That's why mm -hmm. democracy and republicanism can be appropriate for some times and then become radically inappropriate for others. And I think we're entering into one of these periods. So your position then is that republican forms of government are not good in and of themselves, but they are a means to an end. Yes. All forms of government okay. are a means to an end. And okay. neither monarchy nor oligarchy nor democracy is good in and of itself. It's only good based on the good of the human society that that it governs. Okay, that's fair enough. And with regards I'm to not, this conversation, I don't, I don't, I don't think. Just to be clear, I believe that the Constitution can be amended for a reason. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the Constitution lays out a set of. Um, amendments which are necessarily timeless. For example, the Second Amendment wouldn't apply in the year zero because mm -hmm. guns didn't exist. So I agree with you insofar that, th that the Constitution prescribes, in some cases, sets of rights which are timeless. For example, you can't kill people. I think that you can, you can derive that principle directly from the Constitution. It presupposes not murdering people for fun. Right. But there are other elements of the Constitution which are time and place oriented. For example, the Second Amendment. Right. Yeah. Well, most people. The, yeah. We, we, we could talk about sort of natural law, which is like eternal human law that carries through most societies. Like you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't lie. And, you know, that's, that's a broader topic about, you know, natural laws that all societies follow or natural patterns of morality that all societies follow. But when we say constitutionalism, we, we typically mean a certain kind of limited government mm -hmm. that's basically proscribed by a document that's followed religiously. Now, now I do have a problem with the Constitution, and it was funny enough that you mentioned that because Aaron released a, a piece uh, just today. I haven't even read it, but I know it's going to say it because we all read the same authors. But I mean, I, it, this comes from Joseph de Maistre. Like, a constitution is kind of a ridiculous idea if people don't believe in it and the reason why i mean why does the constitution have weight when the people who wrote it are dead no longer in power uh even this idea presupposes that we're going to treat this constitution with a sort of religious reverence that would be considered mm -hmm. insane for a lot of previous societies and a lot of non-western societies and, you know, this is what Joseph de Maistre, he's a, a French philosopher, said he, he, a constitution is really just a, a restatement of societal values that are already implicit in the culture. Now, the problem, what, what we're dealing with right now is that this constitution in many ways, it, it describes in its original form, a set of values that our society largely has abandoned. And it, it, it largely is written for a culture that no longer reflects anything about where our society is right now. I mean, if you if you talk to our current leaders, the people who wrote this constitution were horrible racist white male imperialists who you know were slaveholders and did all other sorts of bad things. And the antipathy we have between that culture and this is so radical, you, you can't imagine that this is binding in any meaningful way. And so what good is a constitution that does not bind the leaders that it supposedly sits above? 
Okay. What good is a Bible that no one follows? Precisely. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> you could say that no, no, it's for future asking, generations I'm, I'm to putting, see. I'm putting, I'm, putting, I'm putting the point back to you. You say you're a Christian, right? Would you object? Yeah. Would you reject? Would you say that the Bible ceases to be true if no one believes it? Uh, I would say it, but there's one important difference about the Bible. The thing about the Bible is the Bible is spoken approximately by God. And God does not require believers to validate his own words. They just are holy. Now, if you if you want to say that the Constitution is sort of like, it is infused with holiness such that we could consider it a divine no. revelation, I think that, you know, you no. might have a case. But, but you know, uh, if this is just a document that some guys wrote 300, no, it was less than 300 years ago, but, you know, um, you know, 200 and something odd years ago, if it's just a document that some guys wrote 100 and something odd years ago, then that absolutely depends on society's reference for those people, those ideas, and the morality system they followed, which at this point among our ruling class is very, very low. I think there's a fundamental, um, I think you're conflating epistemology and uh, social force in the following way. You're saying, well, if this is just a thing which people wrote, you know, and it doesn't have any weight to it. The social force of whether or not it has any weight to it is irrespective of whether or not the principles contained therein are true, correct, good, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you I mean, it's, it's are a, the constitution is a document by government, right? Right. Um, whether or not it's a document by government is not the point. The point is either the principles contained within that document are true and worth defending or they're not. Now, you could make an argument and say, well, some of the principles in it are true and worth defending, and some of those principles are outmoded, outdated, and built for another time. That's a fair yeah. point. I just want to know which one you're going with. I don't think there's – I don't I'm – not, I'm not – you could probably find something – announced in the Constitution that I would consider an eternal moral imperative. But as far as I can tell, most of the things in the Constitution are just suggestions about how we organize government. Like, for instance, it says two senators a state. So let's say that I create a future republic that has three senators a state. Does that mean that I've violated some moral statute that's eternally etched into the fabric of the universe? No. It's just that I decided that I'd do three as opposed to two. And if three works better, then three is better. And if two works better, two is better. Uh, as far as I know, there are very few eternal principles proclaimed in the Constitution the way that it, I would expect to see them in something like uh, the Beatitudes or the Decalogue or the Psalms, although the Psalms aren't moralistic, but you get the idea, right? Uh, the, the Constitution is a document that organizes government and supposedly limits it. It either does that or it doesn't. And, you know, maybe there is some moral sentiment in there that I'd have to take seriously, but I would only take it seriously because of its coincidental resemblance or something that I consider religious. Okay, that's, that's fair. The reason I'm asking is I want to really drill down to get down to the point of this, because a lot of this gets conflated. The question that, um, as I see it, that the neo-reactionaries have with everyone else is this. The neo-reactionaries, as near as I can tell, are not moral relativists. They don't believe that anything just goes morally, because if they did, the Constitution wouldn't matter. It would make no difference if they were moral relativists. The moral relativist would say, well, it's the relativist culture. This culture accepts the Constitution, or it doesn't. It makes no difference one way or the other. I don't think they are, because the neo-reactionaries, as near as I can tell, have a moral worldview. What I think, and I think the way that the, the neo-reactionaries are misunderstood, is that the neo-reactionaries believe that there was a certain set of sociological conditions which allowed the kind of government prescribed by the Constitution to function in an effective manner. And it seems to me that they believe that the underlying, that the principles that underlie the Constitution are no longer socially accepted, and therefore the programs of government or the rules or rights prescribed by said document are no longer fit for purpose. Is that pretty close to right? That's a good okay. summary, yes. You know, I, I think that the, the theory is 
most neo reactionary authors just operate in a pure mode of description. So it's very hard to say. I mean, some people call Nick Land a nihilist, <laughs> but most neo reactionaries, uh, I... like 90% of them are, uh, are Christians and are definitely not, are, are definitely moral objectivists. They believe in a absolute moral standard. But that's different from saying, hey, this government doesn't work. Okay. But, but again, uh, I don't know why I would say if they're pure descriptivists because they're certainly using morally loaded language all the time. Whenever they're describing things, they always use morally loaded language. So I don't know that they're pure descriptivists. Look, I, I, I'm, I, am a, I am a moral objective. I hate using the word objectivist because it sounds like Ayn Rand. I am not a moral relativist. I believe right, in right. You believe real in objectively good true moral values. Yes, right. I do. Yes. I just don't think they're located in the Constitution. Sure. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. I, I have a couple of, I think, issues with neo-reactionaries. And I, at some point we should get into Netter because that's the big, the big discursive oh, problem. Yeah. But, but I think the big problem is a lot of the neo-reactionaries, and I would take with Yarvin on this, I would take this up with Oron. Uh, I've taken this up. Uh, I think this about, um, oh, what was his name? Charles I Haywood. Can't uh, Charles Haywood is yes, the guy that wrote it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Him, uh, a lot of these guys have, I think, a wrong understanding of how we got to where we are. And I think that, I think Joseph Demetra's account in some cases for these guys is quite compelling. Mm -hmm. But I also think that they carry with themselves a huge load of baggage, which which is not correct. The neo-reactionaries, as near as I can tell, um, how do I put this clearly? I, I don't think the neo-reactionaries understand how postmodernism operates, and I think they don't understand that really all of their neo-reactionary philosophy at the end comes down to liberalism didn't stop postmodernism, and they don't understand that postmodernism is going to rip apart neo-reactionary philosophy as well. Uh, neo-reactionary philosophy the... is postmodern. I mean, it's, I mean, well, it's hold a reaction on. to this condition uh, that we're in, right? This is... Okay. There's a di when I say postmodern, I mean Derda and Foucault. Mm-hmm. I mean, accepting, and if you accept Derrida and Foucault, congratulations, you are a moral relativist. There's no way out for you. If you accept what both of mean? them because of their... Derrida and Foucault both laid out a doctrine of, of how language works and how truth works that precludes the possibility of objective knowledge, objective truth, and objective morality. I reject their description of truth, but... Would I recognize Derrida and Foucault as being is the natural... I see Derrida and Foucault as being the natural endpoint of post-religious thought. I think Nietzsche predicted this kind of thought, and I think what we're seeing right now in Derrida and Foucault is the death of God that was pretty much a fait accompli when our society started secularizing. Now, in an irreligious state, you pretty much have to imagine that your elite's going to hit. If they don't read Derrida and Foucault, they're going to start thinking like Derrida and Foucault, because that's the direction that all human minds go in, in the absence of a religious faith that has a solid moral fixture. They're nothing special. Oh, 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 I don't think, I don't think nines naturally move in the direction of Jacques Derrida. They naturally move in the mode of deconstruction. The, the details, I think, are less important than, than how these characters are described. Uh, because there are always kind of weird, kooky people like this. You get back 300 years, you get the Marquis de Sade, who, you know, I don't know if I really want to compare him to Michel Foucault exactly, but I consider him, you know, temperament-wise to be very, very similar. But he was just like this random kook who spent his life in an insane asylum. Why did these ideas yeah. Yeah, sure. take fire and get adopted everywhere? I do not think that, you know, this this is some kind of like zombie infection. And if you got rid of these two guys, nothing would happen. Like you end wokeness. Like this 
our society was looking for ideas that sounded like this because it was going in a certain secular direction. If Foucault had been hit by a bus when he was seven, somebody else would have done this because it's it just naturally suggested by the state we are in culturally, religiously, and civilizationally. Okay, so when Foucault and Derrida started writing their postmodern ideas, again, and Searle talks about this, these were people who had a poli pol particular political ideology, and from their particular political ideology, they were looking for a philosophy that would allow them to enact it or give them excuses to enact it. And they realized quite correctly, as Searle says, that if they got rid of that objective truth and standards of object standards of objective truth and objective quality are standing in their way. And so they came up with a philosophy that they wanted to use. Kelly Oliver, feminist philosopher, very, very explicitly stated that they what they wanted was theories that were politically useful, not true theories, not false theories. Isn't that what Dave is saying, is that the culture at large was just looking for theories to pen their justifications for acting in the way that they do outside of, let, let's just say, objective moral truth. I'm going back to Eldon Eisenach, and Eldon Eisenach argues, and I think he's cor correct about this, that what happened in the 1920s, or leading up to the 1920s through characters like John Dewey, was the creation of a political hegemony of progressivism. And the political hegemony of progressivism, as Eisenach says, turned the universities into sort of a church. And what that did is it changed the milieu. And it created, in Eisenach's term, a sort of a new American political regime. And what he says is that the progressives had a moral center, they had a moral worldview, most of them were Christians, most of them were mainline Protestants, a lot of them were Orthodox, and he gives names, but that they had a faith in progress, and that they created a political hegemony within universities, academia, journalism, etc., 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 this got into education, and it, it engaged the project of socially transforming what the institutions were. The problem is that because they were seeking progressivism and always looking for the new ideas, and they were not liberals or conservatives, they were progressives, and Eisenach distinguishes those things, they left themselves open to attack from the postmoderns. The postmoderns again, joining in with the neo-Marxists, took over your institutions of culture through a long march. I actually don't think that the culture at large in the 60s and 70s was looking to do away with objective truth. I think that mm. there was activists, activists in universities in the 60s and 70s who were looking for a particular political program. And with the increasing f utter failure of Marxism in the form of the Soviet Union, they needed something. And so what they decided to do, or what they were drawn to, was a set of philosophies which allowed them to subvert, dismantle, deconstruct, and otherwise tear apart the standards and the standards of objective morality, the standards of objective epistemology that were used to uh, demarcate truth and to separate good from bad, to separate quality from not quality. And they realized that they needed to do that. So I would say that I, don't, I agree that once there's a, there's a line like, you know, once you get rid of God, all things are permitted. That's from Brothers Kamazov, yes. And that's the phenomenon that I'm pointing to as being Dostoevsky and Friedrich Nietzsche saw where this was going a hundred years before it happened. I, I really, you know, I just don't buy the idea that this, these ideas were just nowhere and then they just popped into existence in the, in oh, the no, they early were formed 80s. Very, sort of. very specifically. Like deconstruction and the way that it operates was formed very, very specifically as an attack on liberalism, as was as was Foucaultian was as was Foucault's ideas. These ideas were formulated very specifically, and the authors repeatedly talk about how they're doing that. Angela Harris in the uh, the juris in in her article on jurisprudence, jur I think it's called the jurisprudence of postmodernism, explicitly says that they are adopting postmodernism for its corrosive power. I mean, this was self reflexively. They they explicitly yeah, but, over and over and over claim that that's what they're doing. I this where we disagree. I don't think that you're dealing with postmodernism. I think you're dealing with, I think you're dealing with a decaying civilization, and postmodernism is just like some superficial thing laying on top of it. 
I think postmodernism is the acid which is dissolving this civilization. Not the death of God. Yeah, I think the death of God uh, is the acid dissolving the civilization. Yeah, but most of the most of the most see, and this is and this is where the thing is, is that most Americans are not are not irreligious. M Americans are a tremendously religious people, even still. Most Americans their still leadership in classes are religious. Ooh, okay, and they, and and regardless of whether they're irreligious, they're irreligious in practice. They do not practice their faith, and their religious feelings are vague. And not they are in in the universe again. As Alden, as I as I pointed out with Alden Eisenach's point, they've turned the universities into their progressive church, and the religious doctrine is the religious doctrine of progressivism. If postmodernism or wokeness, let's just use that term, uh, is not the responsibility of a liberalism, but rather secularism, how do liberals then win against the leftists or the woke woke wokies? And how do the neo reactionaries like the, There's the, there's a difference in tactics, and that's where the conversation that I'm hosting comes from. No enemies to the right, or how do we win? And there is a tension between the liberals and the neo reactionaries. The liberals are afraid of the neo reactionaries because the neo reactionaries have some unsavory ideas, or at least associate or don't have a problem associating with people who have unsavory ideas, and the neo reactionaries have a problem with liberals because liberals are weak and say don't fight uh, hold your ground uh, any 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 sort of fight is going to uh, cede to the left they're going to call you a bigot so on and so yeah, forth yeah the, the no enemies to the right thing is kind of strange because it, it literally has the right wingers advancing with classically as a liberal position on our attitudes towards people to our right uh, which is you know, what well, so the no enemies to the right argument hinges on one key distinction, the distinction between a conversational adversary and an out and out enemy. When you have somebody whose opinion you don't like, do you shun them from society? Do you get them fired? Do you go after their bank accounts or do you disagree with them? Now, of course, there's always limitations, right? If someone's going to advocate like, you know, murder and rape to be practiced, <laughs> I'm never going to have a debate with that. But when it comes to conversations about facts and ideas, uh, to my right, the idea is, is that I don't want to cooperate with the cancellation campaigns already underfoot. And so the attitude of never uh, no enemies to the right is not no disagreements to the right, is that, that our disagreements to the right are in the space when they are not transgressive against a moral position are kept in the realm of intellect and not in the realm where we go after people's jobs and fire them from their position at a school or fire their friends from a position at the school, uh, school because they said something online that we consider to be offensive because it goes quote unquote too far. Uh, you know, this, this is necessary to have the kind of deep explorations into ideas that I think is necessary to really break free of you know, this very, very small realm of thought we occupy in the late 20, in, well, in the early 21st century. So I think the the point that Benjamin just touched on as we were leaving our last point and into this one is the, is the salient thing. Mm -hmm. My view is that the political left created all of these social theories with the political ends in mind first, and they cast aside the truth to do it. That's my view. Okay. Well, do you mean like Adorno and Marcuse or Derrida or all Marx? Like when, like all of them? Okay. So if you actually go back and read, I'm, I'm writing an essay on this right now because the old line was that postmodernism and Marxism are incompatible because postmodernism rejects meta narratives and rejects objective truth and rejects objective morality and Marxism is supposedly, but if you actually read the Marxists, read like, read Jay Martin's The Dialectical Imagination. And if you actually read him, when the Marxisms, when Marxism from the, I would say early 20th century, started moving into cultural criticism through the Frankfurt School, mm -hmm. the sociology of knowledge came to the fore and they start objecting in objecting to objective truth early on gramsci says all, all everything um the anti-essentialism is actually there in a latent form too because i think everything is historically constructed yeah i agree, totally agree with you that postmodernism is is antithetical to classic marxism 
uh, was it Paul Godfrey most recently laid out how this went? I mean, they, they're sort of they're biological, they're kind of genealogically related in that most postmodern progressives were influenced by Marxists. Uh, a lot of them were Marxists, at least in their early persuasions. But the um, but the the ideologies are radically different between the two forms. But the, the yeah, essential totally point is that that, that they yeah. discarded truth. Was, but my <laughs> yes, the the Marxists when they shifted into neo Marxism, uh, they took on the social doctrines related to epistemology. Um, for example, historicism that all. All knowledge is historically located and therefore historically constructed and therefore historically contingent. And they also say, uh, um, Gramsci comes right out and says that he thinks there's no objective truth. Like he's just, he just full force goes right out with that. Let me just pull up the quote here so that yeah. we can read it and you can see what no, I mean. I'll, I'll, I'll I don't it. Think... I, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So I don't think that the Marxists and the postmodernists are these completely far apart things. I think that the old line materialist, anti-capitalist, you know, take over the factories Marxism, that's been dead probably for more than 100 years, for the most part. And it's the neo-Marxists who took Marx's program and his and went from his materialist understanding where we are looking at the who has the money, who has the wealth, who has the power, who controls the government, and it went into the mm -hmm. cultural sphere. And I think that the 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 discarding of truth happens back then. It's already there in the 60s and 70s. The postmodernists just came along and said, hey, this is kind of already here. We can kind of already do this. Let's just push it to its next thing. And the, re now, the point that question. I'm making here... The point that I want here's here, just let me get this this feeling out sure. is when they put your politics first, when you say the goal is how do we achieve our political ends when that is the center pillar of your view, which it is for the left, truth is gonna die, and that's my worry with the neo reactionaries is too many of them are focused purely on. Uh, and that's no enemies to the right as well. It's not no enemies who are false. It's no enemies to the right. And when Charles wrote that article, one of the guys, when he was defending Acord, someone's like, I, I said to him and other people said, Acord is bringing in this relativistic epistemology. He's buying into standpoint epistemology of the postmoderns full force and full throttle. And, and, and Charles Haywood, when someone said, look, Charles is defending this guy and thinks we should even leave Thomas Acord alone, alone. He would said yes, no enemies well, well, to the right. Well, I got I got to correct you here. You didn't disagree with Acord. You got him fired. <laughs> so, like, that's what we're oh. dealing with here. Like, this is not about a disagreement. Oh. And you, I need to say this too. You didn't just get <sighs> okay. Acord fired. You got like I didn't get anyone fired. fired. Okay, well, I'm saying the the article that Charles Haywood wrote, a nail enemies was yeah. to the right, was directed at Rod Dreher who started a hysterical campaign against Acord, who's anonymously posting, he's anonymously edgy posting, and he got him fired from his school, along with a ton of other people, for not renouncing him preemptively and signing on to all these weird statements that are factually inaccurate about history. Like, that's what Acord? we're reacting to is a cancellation campaign. Now, if you want to go on and, like, debate the points about what Thomas Acord said about nationalism or histor uh, the historical necessity of ethnicity in politics, I think that's an interesting thing we need to do. But you know, if you're going to say that like we're going to fire everybody who entertains nationalist ideas, a that's a principle that's not consistently applied anywhere in the mainstream world. We have the New York Times this week promoting the creation of black-only states. A few years ago, it was saying that maybe we should have segregated uh play spaces for different races uh, look if you're gonna fire people for saying things that 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 the new york times is saying with a different racial group attached that is a huge problem for open discourse and that if, if you if you play hmm. ball with that I, I don't see how that this is this is representative of any kind of moral standard that could justify itself in any way um, you know, well, for for the for the point here is so I, there's a couple of things wrong with the narrative here. First off, it's not. I would have a serious problem if they had went and got Acord fired from a Denny's, or if they had gotten Acord fired from his job selling lawnmowers, even if he was doing really well at selling lawnmowers. 
or his job building guitars. I would have a huge problem with that. And I would say, look, we don't take a, go after people's livelihoods for reasons, for things like that. But what Acor did under his, well, what first of all, there do? were two things. One, what did he do? One, I'm, I'm going, he did, there's two things. One is the bold faced lying he was doing in public. Fair enough. Two, he, he was attempting, uh, to, to, in his, in his podcast, he was saying one thing and then privately saying another thing. And he had beams about how his anonymous account was his real beliefs. And then three, his, his views on education as they were espoused called for racial segregation. And the he was a headmaster the of a New school. The New York Times just called for that, dude. The New York Times has called for that. Yes. And and here's the point. Okay, and so here's like, the this point. Is, this, is ridiculous, someone... this is ridiculous. Like you, you're not firing for this. If Thomas Acord oh, had said this about oh, any other race, would. you would not be fired. I absolutely would. You oh, would wait, know wait, wait, hold on. It is true. Oh, wait. It is true that the left absolutely does not police this stuff when it comes from the left. That's absolutely true. You could say abhorrent racial things about segregation. And in fact, Chris Rufo's done wonderful reporting on, on things like affinity groups being pushed this, in public schools which separate by race and people don't get fired. I'm not disagreeing. What I am saying is that when the left gives up its standards, I'm not giving up mine. Especially when there, someone's there, got the power to actually here. enact them in a school. There's two things here. First of all, you're, I mean, like the, the there is a, look, the context of this individual person is one thing. And it's important to understand that you didn't just fight, that you didn't just fire a court. You fired like five people because they wouldn't denounce him. I'm, I, I'm, I don't know the number, but I know one of my actually, one of my good friends was fired from the school uh, because he, he refused, I mean, you know, they didn't call it that, asked to resign or whatever, because he wouldn't go along with the ridiculous state, ahistorical statements about the nature of ethnicity and nation building and, and nationhood. Now, I mean, like th this but behavior. But it's a Christian around, school. Yeah, exactly. But it's a Christian school. Fire, you, can, have you can fire. If you don't people, believe like, the doctrine, they can fire some, you. Some, somebody could say the f word in public, and the Christian school could fire them for that. But but if this is going to be the standards for like an intellectual environment where you can't discuss a common belief in most of human civilization, like for instance. The the idea that races should have separate con or ethnicities, I should say, because it wasn't just races in the way we conceive of them now, but the idea that races that that ethnicities should have separate nations and stay predominantly in those nations is a historically common belief, and to say that if you get caught discussing this belief in any serious way in an anonymous space, we're going to fire you as an academic. You have killed any historical discourse, any serious philosophical discourse. Is, but, but is your view that any? I, I need to ask you this, Wilco. Is your view that any nationalism should be a fireable offense for an academic, like prescriptively? I, I know, I know that like this Christian school could have fired Obviously you for saying the f bomb. Well, okay. Obviously so then, not. okay. So there are are there some ethnicities where you can you can advocate for nationalism on the behalf of, but some ethnicities you can't. Oh, like for no, instance, no, I, 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 think, I, I, my wife is I Canadian. Think national, I think I think ethnic national. So so here here's the thing. I th I, th I want to get stay on point with the A court example because this is exactly the question. Is this is, is any form question. of nationalism acceptable? That's the question. Yes. Sure. I, I work for I work for a nationalist think tank, which is the Center for Renewing America, where Chris, where Russ Vought has expre explicitly in McLean's magazine written a defense of Christian nationalism. But that's not what Acord was doing. He was defending ethnic Acord nationalism, was doing, which is the most common form but, of nationalism. But well, even further than that, he was putting forth and defending postmodernism. The postmodern doctrine of standpoint epistemology. That's not right? why he got Wouldn't fired, you... dude. That's not why he got oh, fired. Oh. He didn't get fired because he called Jack Derrida. Oh no, 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 no. His on his his argument about race said that because these race is real and because these people have different racial standpoints, they should be racially segregated. Now, if you're going to say, well, we should welcome a Thomas Accord into our tent, I'm not going to bring in somebody who's going to bring in the epistemological underpinnings and the epistemological assumptions of my enemies. When I said I was going after postmodernism and critical theory, that means everyone. 
So this idea should just, you should just fire all that. I mean, the problem with this is that I'm trying to understand exactly what your standard is for firing people. Like, is the idea that you, like, this is obviously in a, I think it's oh, in the highest. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I like, should say so this. I think that the only justification for firing Acord has to do with the internal standards of the school. I don't think if he was dealing with any other job, he should have been fired. Truck no, driver, computer that's programmer. Bullshit. No, he, should, he shouldn't have been. These, these, yeah. this, 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 these statements were not spoken in the capacity he had as a teacher. They're spoken private. They're, not, they're spoken on an anonymous account online. So, so the idea no, but, that this but, is, you know, again, like it's a private okay, well, school. He, they can fire him for saying the F word, but... But I mean, no, well, I ask this. So they're a Christian school, right? If he had privately admitted that he was actually an atheist, should that be fireable? Yeah, I think they could fire him for that. This is what I'm saying, right? They could fire him for that. They could fire him for, you know, right. saying the F word. Because okay. that is profanity, so, right? Like so move, as a Christian gentleman, so move, and they certainly can fire him for lying, right? But that's not, you know, the, the thing is, local. the reason why this made so many people angry is that this, this didn't end with a chord. This, this carried on and got a bunch of other people fired for not essentially renouncing all forms of nationalism that had any ethnic component to them. Oh, I, well, so, I so like that's, that's what people are really that angry about. That that's right. Okay. Oh, oh, no, no, no. This, this, I think there's a Martin Bailey here going on too, because no, no, because but this, this is what happened. Thing, and this though. is why we, this is obviously why they fired him. It had nothing to do with, the, you know, misrepresenting his opinions online. It had to do with his explicit nationalist beliefs. That's why the other people got fired. No, it had to do with his lying explicit racist stuff, beliefs. He wouldn't. Okay, what it wasn't that you're, you're, you're like, well, like for example, calling a sitting congressman a negress would be one of them. Yeah, that's racial profanity. Like, a, 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 a okay, abhorrent, again, abhorrent that, views about if, Jews. If that I mean, I mean, it was pretty because, clear. Vocal, listen to me. You're, I keep on saying this, and I don't know if you're, the mic's breaking up or you're not hearing me. If that was the reason Accord got fired, then it would have ended with Accord, but it didn't. So I know that that wasn't the reason. There were there were subsequent firings because think... people wouldn't sign on to ideological positions that were essentially renouncing all nationalism that had an ethnic component to it. Most nationalism has always had an ethnic component to it. This has been the reality of human existence. And it probably will be the reality in the future with different ethnic breakdowns because ethnicities change over time. That's how I know this was not, as you described it, this was not a narrowly, this was not a narrow uh, a removal because a guy used racial profanity online or because he misrepresented what he said online when he was asked about it. This was more ideological and it was broader and that was what would be being driven by the hysteria that was driven, that was kicked up by Rod Dreher, m largely after Accord was fired. I've read all of Rod Dreher's, I've read all of Rod Dreher's articles on this, and the point that I am making to you is that, well, there's a couple of things. First, as many people have pointed out, um, how do I put this? When you say ethnicity, does ethnicity do you have a racial component? Ethnicity always has a racial component. For instance, my wife comes from Canada. We have the First Nations there. That is a ethnicity. It also is a racial component because people there are characterized by their lineage, by their blood as being part of those tribes or not. That is racial in my definition. Is it not? Why? Why does this? Why does this whole argument boil down to race, though? Why? Why is race so uh, important question. to the uh, to the liberal versus neo reactionary fight versus the the woke fight? Everybody's fighting over race. Like, why is this so important? That's an excellent quest. That's an excellent excellent question. Because the point is, the liberals say you are judged by your beliefs. They're creedal. And with respect to race and particularly biology, they don't think, they think that nations, if nations are to be formed, ought to be formed on the basis of creed, not on the basis of race. 
and what they think. And the reason why you said, well, for having any sort of ethnic nationalism. Well, Stephen Wolf's book, he explicitly states that when he's talking about ethnicity, he's not talking about race. He says that very, very explicitly. Like Stephen Wolf has been really, really clear about this. In fact, he posted up a picture when someone asked him about this of Clarence Thomas, of sorry, um, who's this? Yeah, Clarence Thomas, who's black, and his wife, who's white, and says, This is a good and fitting marriage. Uh, look, yeah, the, this issue is not about individual interracial marriages. Everyone here is fine. Well, I know. I know. I'm just making making sure that I don't straw man Stephen Wolf's position. I want to make sure that I'm I'm representing him accurately. He's very explicit. But now you're saying, well, all ethnicity has a a race, and what what the reason why people are on this is because they think that the ethnic that there's a Mott and Bailey going on here. That the Mott is well, nationalisms have have Almost all nationalisms have had some sort of ethnic component. So if you want to protect America, you have to be some form of nationalist. And so nationalism is some form of this. And that has some sort of race realist position to it. And now if you want to be an American nationalist, you, you have to buy realist? into a sort of racial nationalism. What, what do you, well, I'm interested, though. What do you mean by race realist? There are inherent biological divisions between races that prevent them from forming common nations and communities. Uh, the prevent them from forming common nations and communities seems to be doing a lot of work because there have been many multiracial yeah. nations. So what about the belief, the first so then, part? But you just said that there has to be... A... Well, the hold on, but if there's been lots of multiracial na nations, then you could have a multi-ethnic nationalism, and what's the problem with nationalism at that point? Why can't we have multi-ethnic nationalism? Multi-ethnic nationalism works a lot different than monoethnic nationalism. Uh, my my grandparents came from a multi-ethnic nationalist na nation called the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which worked a lot differently than some place like France or England, where, you know, there were some minority races in there, but it was predominantly one ethnicity. And it was a lot less stable because of that, too. What about multiracial nationalism? What about multiracial nationalism? Well, I think it's more or less the same. I... I I, I, unlike you, I'm, I'm, I'm not so certain about the clear distinction between ethnicity and race. To me, they seem to be tightly linked. You could make a subtle distinction, I'm sure. Ethnicity is about culture, race is about biology. And then historically, they're, st they're still incredibly correlated, right? Yeah, yeah, but that has to do with the ability of people to travel and things like that. Like, I, I see no problem why, why people of different races can't form a, cul a common culture. Because it sounds like once you walk down the road that you're sounding like, it sounds a lot like we're going to get up with some sort of if you're going to have a nationalism, on your view, we're going to have some kind of ethnic and racial component to it. Well, if nations need to be separate, we're walking down the road of racial. I'm not a nationalist. By the you know, way. you're not, but but for the people who are nationalist, all of a sudden they they are, if your description is correct, going to be having to walk down some kind of road of racial segregation, or at the very least, racial policing to ensure a large homogeneous racial majority. No, I mean, like, so so for instance, when you say segregation, uh, do you mean? for segregation, or do you mean just letting people live where they want? From what you've told me, if nationalism implies an ethnic and racial component, then to have a nation, you have to have, at the very least, a majority, a homogeneous majority race. Well, what, 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 I, I just told you that there were multi-ethnic and multiracial nationalisms like Singapore and Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? Okay. They work a lot differently than the more cohesive mono-ethnic nationalisms, but they're still possible. Like we can read history and see that they're possible, you know. But right. you know, I'll put this one. I asked you a question about you know integration versus segregation. I mean, my grandmother lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and she lived in a town that was German, and then you know, twenty miles away, there's a town that was entirely Hungarian. And then 20 miles to the south, there's a town that's entirely Slavic. And everyone stayed in their own little bubbles. They even spoke different languages. Uh, that's been, because, and it wasn't because like there was a law that said that they had to stay there. They're just, they spoke different languages, they had different customs. They didn't want to live together. Is that segregation in your book? Or is that, you know, is that dangerous ethno nationalism? Uh, well, I, I don't. 
and, and this is this is kind of the point that I'm, I'm I'm trying to hit on. The liberals have no patience for the position that nationalism requires ethnicity of race, and they think, as Jordan Peterson has said on a number of occasions, that once you bring race and ethnicity into your nationalism, that's gone too far. And they're policing their borders and boundaries and saying, we're not going to work with you. That's what they're doing. Now, a cord getting fired was probably for Rod Dreher is, why is this guy, t- I don't want the man who says these things to teach my kids. And so I'm going to use my position on Twitter and my notoriety to get him gone. Whether or not you agree with that, I can't think of another position where somebody who has done what Accord has done has had a bunch of right wingers go after him for his job at other places. For example, yeah, if he I, was see, the owner I see that rhetoric of, come uh, out well, not, of maybe, yeah, teachers' no. mouths all the time where I live. It just has a different race attached to it all the time. This is a common sentiment if you just switch the race. Okay, so seeing a hysteria campaign kicked around to remove a guy and all his friends because he flipped the race on a sentiment that's common where I live, that seems to me to be hysterical and out of line. Now, if you, if you, want, to talk, if you want to talk about ideal situations where racism has come into dialectic, you know, we can talk about that. Well, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 wait. You're, set, you're comparing the leftist standards and saying, well, hold on, the left doesn't hold anybody to these standards and this rhetoric is common on the left. Yeah, but but why should I tolerate it within the political party that I'm trying to be a part of? I mean, the, another thing that's common on the left is a, a pro-abortion sentiment. I wouldn't tolerate pro-abortion sentiment on my side. Uh, look, 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 again, again, you can fire people for any reasons you want. No, that's not the point. I wouldn't tolerate pro-abortion rhetoric in my group. I don't care that the left tolerates pro-abortion rhetoric. I'm not tolerating, tolerating pro-abortion rhetoric in my group and with the people that I'm working with. Yeah, I agree. You shouldn't. Now, the more important question when it comes to nationalism is, you know, to what extent do we want to, you know, take people who say things that are racially nationalist and kick them out of their, or organize campaigns where we kick them out of their positions? That seems to me the relevant thing. And and the first question, I think, with all this nationalism stuff is, well, you are obviously afraid of segregation, right? I think we can put people- I don't know that I'm afraid of it. Okay, are you con- I dislike are you it. concerned about it? What? I think it's evil. I think racial segregation, the forced racial segregation, either socially, socially forced. or politically okay. or forced segregation is evil. Okay, forced segregation. Cool. Look, if a group of people say, look, we don't speak the same language, so you live over there and we we'll live over here, just because we don't speak the same language, eh, I don't really care about that. But if someone comes along and says, hey, you can't live with us because you have the wrong color skin, I t- I'm, we're going to have a problem. And and here's the thing. Let's talk about n- no enemies to the right. We're not going to attack somebody. Let's say n- not even fire them, but we're going to say, you can't be in our, our club. We won't allow you to run for our positions. We won't allow you to join our think tanks. We won't allow you to be a part of our, our endeavors. Let's say that the idea is, who are we going to break bread with politically? Who are we going to get along yeah. with politically? Now, I've said, Who are you going to actually talk to and not just fire? Right. Or Or who am I going to say... Or who am I going to let be a part of my political party or let run for office? Or who are we going to let into our think tank? Or who are we, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who are we going to hire to work for us at, at Center for Renewing America or whatever? Okay. If someone says, I want abortion legal up until the ninth months, for me, that's a line. I won't let that, I won't work it with that person at a think tank that's espousing conservative beliefs. I might work with them at a university, but I would not work with them in terms of a political think tank. And I wouldn't vote for them if they won say the the nomination of a of a of a, a political nomination in my party okay that's a bridge too far it sounds like the context is very very it's very very reliant on what context you work with these people in pursuing a political goal who am i willing to welcome into the political tent and i am not willing to welcome someone into the political tent who says abortion up until nine months whether or not that rhetoric exists in the public sphere out there among the leftists or even in the culture i don't care 
That makes no difference to me. In my political tent, if you say abortion up until the ninth month, sorry, man, I can't work with you. Okay, fair enough. I mean, you can organize how you want. That's what I say. When people say no enemies to the right, we're policing boundaries on the right. There has to be who will we allow into the political right word tent? Who are we going to gatekeep and who are we not? I'm saying one person I'm willing to gatekeep is up, abortion up until the ninth month. Now, that's a left-wing thing. I think everyone on the right would gatekeep that, or at least most of them would, I hope. So what about the right? Who do we gatekeep on the right? Or do we? I, I think that, I, you know, if we're I'm talking asking about you, is there anyone on the right you would gatekeep? Yeah, people who are guilty of moral infractions or directly promoting moral infractions. Like if I said, go and rape people or go and murder people, obviously you can't have that in an intellectual space, right? But but I think that, you know, the the, the, the nub comes with, with these, these ideas that are historically common, right? Like you have a bunch of historically common ideas, like people wanting to, for instance, I'll say this, people wanting to live among people who look like them and believe the same religion that they do, that is a historically common belief. Do you agree with that? Sure. Yeah. I don't think that that belief can be excluded from any serious intellectual conversation or intellectual environment. And I'm not so sure that that feeling is it in itself immoral outside of some other action that would make it immoral. You have to do something else but, but want to live among people who look like you to be an immoral person. You have to do something else that's cruel to somebody. Okay, but, but I, would, I would say, you're saying that, well, we can't have that out because it's historically common, but lots of views are historically common, which we would find absolutely morally abhorrent wouldn't well, break well, bread with people over. Is that belief outside of your Overton window, the one I just stated, the desire to live among people who are the same race and ethnicity as you? So if you mean by that, I want to live amongst people who have the same racial features that I do, same skin color roughly, that look like me, that are part of my race, and that race in and of itself is a necessary condition for my community, I, didn't say I would say, yeah, that's a problem. I said one condition among many. No, no, but I'm saying if that's if that's a necessary condition, there might be other conditions. But I'm saying if that's one necessary condition, then then no, I'm not willing to have that be a necessary condition. So, for instance, I, I guess I, I don't see the difference. So for instance, if 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 uh, you know, if this were you know, if this were Austria Hungary, I like using Austria Hungary because the ethnicities, like the racial groups, are so close and and so like not next to the ones that we get angry about in this country it's kind of easy to see it so i mean if you had like my grandfather was german he spoke hungarian fluently when he was younger he, he kind of lost it over the years but i mean if he if he decided to like you know if he said that oh i don't want to have hungarians move in next door uh you know i don't know i mean that's like uh i think that would be a, a sentiment that would be considered very normal back in the, in the middle country right to say that like i want this town to be a german town or whatever I, I kind of think on this issue, I take the same view as Douglas Wilson, which is, I appreciate the people who have said that they don't want to give a, a rat's behind about what the left has to say about ethnicity, but have forgotten what God has to say about it. And I'm not willing to say, under any circumstances, that someone who says, sorry, I don't want to live with you because you have the wrong skin tone or, or ethnicity. Yeah. Um, I, Could, can sorry, you say man. I don't want to live with you because you have the wrong religious belief? Beliefs is a different thing, but yes. You can say I don't want to live in a moral community with people who who have religious beliefs, which I find absolutely abhorrent. For example, I wouldn't want to live in Iran because that's an Islamic hegemony. I, I right? don't know about abhorrent. I'm just saying, like, you know, people like living among people who believe similar things to them. Yeah, believing similar things is one thing. Having a common culture is one thing. Demanding racial, demanding that people look like you racially is a different thing altogether. Because at that point, you are, what does the Lord say? What does he say to Samuel when he's about to anoint? He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I don't think that you should judge anybody on how they look. I believe people are judged based on their moral opinions. I mean, for instance, think about like totally arbitrary, immoral pieces of culture, like the differences between, I don't know, Austrians and French people. Uh, these people have the same religions. They look sort of similar, but the, the French do things differently.
differently than Austrians do. And, and if you mixed a town full of French with a town full of Austrians, then that town would, wouldn't have a very cohesive tradition going forward. You know, the, the history of that peoples would be mixed up. Now, I, look, I've grown yeah. up in multicultural yes, areas and my entire life. I've never lived in a monoculture area as long as I've lived. And I'm fine living in a multicultural area. But I, I understand that, you know, living in a place that's got a, a continuous line going back for, for centuries, where, where there's this cohesive culture, is, uh, is, is different and has a, a quality to it that I respect. Can I ask a question, uh, Dave? Is it true that the neo-reactionaries gravitate towards a monocultural or mono-ethnic uh, preference? No. Is, is that, is that inherent? Not. Okay, so it's not inherent no, to the ideology. Why fact, the hell Why the hell do we keep on getting stuck upon race then? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, one of the reasons is because freedom of association was considered a core classical liberty. And that was essentially undone by, you know, sentiments that came that came into fashion in, in the mid 20th century. The second thing is, is that uh, racial politics, even though, you know, most neo reactionaries are concerned with creating governments for multiracial societies, again, Singapore and places like this are used as a prime example of, of, of sort of how neo reactionary thought is put into into action. Uh, it, it, the, the the idea that multiracial and multi-ethnic societies work differently and have qualitative differences than monoracial and monoethnic ones that's a core observation that mo that that grounds most neo-reactionary thought you'll see this in a lot like in a lot of Yarvin's thought you know in, in those recent conversations with people like ben burgess which is a very hard conversation to watch you have to take into account that multiracial and multi-ethnic societies are different than monoethnic and mo monoracial societies, and that different ethnicities and different races behave differently in relationship to government. If you treat people as interchangeably, you're going to end up in a world of hurt. And that is that is the intersection between neo-reactionary thought and 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 the issue of race, because for the last you know, basically since the 1970s, this country has been making a number of promises about how a post-racial society would behave that just aren't coming to fruition. You know, and this is why a, a lot of the critiques that come from these circles always point back to the civil rights. The civil rights made a number of promises about what a post racial America would look like, and very few of those promises panned out in a positive way for America. How does how does a Christian how does a Christian go back from there? How how does a Christian work his way back morally from the civil rights era? Well, I think the the idea well, I mean, first of all, I do think that there were a lot of legitimate complaints that the civil rights movement had against forced segregation, as Wokel puts it. I think a lot of those laws were humiliating. A lot of those laws were cruel and they needed to be destroyed and some other order of government needed to be put into place. But by the late sixties, what essentially was being promised at the African American community was full equality of outcome. I mean, you, we can say that it was a quality of opportunity that was promised. That is not what people were looking forward to. People were looking forward to a world where Africans and Europeans of the American variety had roughly an equivalent amount of wealth and were integrated across all institutions without things like affirmative action putting a thumb on the scales. And, and that's been almost impossible to achieve. Furthermore, as time's gone on, racial the salience of racial politics has gone up as the country has become more racially diverse, which is also something that you would predict if you looked at all other multiracial societies. Almost all multiracial societies or multiracial democracies have a racial component to their electoral process. That's a, that's a very common fixture in, in places like Lebanon, in places like, you know, you can look all throughout the Middle East where there are multiple ethnicities competing for power. There's very commonly, if not in almost all cases, a racial dynamic to, to how democracies. Do you, that how do you impose that in a post-racial society as a Christian? How do you actually start to discriminate based on race after I don't think from we should. this point? Okay. So I, I don't think we should. I, I I think that I think that the way to <laughs> 
the, the way to, the way forward is to essentially allow people to organize their own communities. I don't, I will not think that, I think that forced integration is kind of, I mean, how do you feel about things like busing and forced integration? Local? Oh, I'm curious. Okay. So here's, so I actually would oppose busing and things like that, but I, I think your argument undermines itself because you were pointing out how there was all these divisions in Europe and that's true, but at least now in Western Europe, these nations get along just fine. And most of these nations, in fact, under the European Union, uh, have people going back and forth and through everything. Now, the European Union has other problems, but at least in terms of places like Germany, France, uh, they, they have grown together enough that the German and the French can get along well. Now, when you import, there is a point, and this is something that the liberal philosopher Joseph Heath writes about in his book, um, uh, cooperation and social justice, there is legitimate concerns about bringing in people who don't share a common culture and how fast and how many of them you can bring in. And also the multicultural uh, salad bowl versus the melting pot. There's a very serious problem there. We can't have a salad bowl. That's not going to work. If we have a melting pot where people assimilate into the culture, that can work. Are people assimilating okay. into the culture in Western Europe? I'm curious, Wilkul. Is that working? Well, hold on. And this is the point that Heath <laughs> Why brings up. Working? Why isn't it? Heath talks about exactly this problem. He says there's two reasons. One, there's one, how many people bring you bring in, and two, how quickly you bring them in. There is a limit to how many people you can bring in and integrate into society and how quickly you can do that. And absolutely, we need to be aware of those limits. You cannot just say, everybody come on in, throw open the border and bring people in. There is a limit that appears to be something like a quarter something less than 1% of your population per year, at most. And so you can't do that. And I, I agree with you that if you bring in I too many people from, from, an, from another culture too quickly, you're going to have serious problems. Okay? And they're doing that in but, Europe? Yes. And by the way, that's why right-wing parties in Europe are flourishing at the moment, because they're going to close the border. That's why Brexit won. Okay? Because they are nowhere near are closing the border. Oh, no, I said that's why white wing parties are flourishing. They're not closing the border, but eventually if they keep on going like this right wing parties of the nationalist and even of the racialist variety, you're going to begin to pop up and start winning elections in large numbers because it can't continue. And I actually agree that there's a problem with an open border. And I actually agree that following Heath, there is a limit. There are serious problems when you bring in too many immigrants too fast that don't speak the national language that can't part communicate, they form uh, ghettos and they and they, and they're they become trapped in cycles of poverty. All of this is a serious problem. But what's your model for a good example? Oh, I think something like a point system. No, 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 no. Like an and, existing and country that's done this well. An existing country that's done this well. Oh, uh, well, Saskatchewan's done it well, and so has Canada. <laughs> Wait, what? I come from <laughs> no, it, I mean, it got kind of. Canada has stricter immigration laws than you do, and when we took in Syrian refugees, we wouldn't no, take in you uh, young males alone. Oh we only God. took in. We only You're took taking in, families. in like one percent of the population a year. It's like insane. I was just talking about this. Can can Canada's 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 pedal to the metal immigration. It's way above that. We don't have Mexico on our southern border. We don't have Mexico what? on our southern border. It's we don't have no, Mexico on our southern border. I, I, no, I was just so I just got back from BC. I you. look, I just I just got back from BC. Like the the amount of immigration to the city's nuts. I mean, the, they've completely changed the the demographic of that city in like ten years. It's a mature. It's but, like. But it's, hold on, but hold on. You said you're you're looking on a national level, right? On a national level, I mean, I'm sure that Vancouver itself, because Vancouver is Canada's equivalent of a sanctuary city, I, I mean, so, it might be different. But in Canada, when we take people in in Canada, we, we limit it. We also, we don't take in, um, we won't take in just pools of young men. We take in families as a whole, because if yeah, you just so, take in pools of young men, that creates problems. Canada has much stricter immigration standards than the United States does. We also take in on a point system. It's it's very different. And, <laughs> but, uh, look, 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 the, the thing is, like, and, the, and the, I'll, the, go, the, I'll go further than that. I'll go further than that and say that one of the problems that saves Canada from this is that it is very difficult to 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 immigrate to Canada illegally. Like try, 
Well, yeah, How? I know. I've, I've, I've tried. Try, I literally have. Um, <laughs> right, believe it right. or not, so I literally the have here's the, here's been the, the border for illegally trying to enter Canada. So but, um, Canada, but, does but, but, have, but Canada but, does not have the racial and cultural segregation problems and the racial and cultural issues that the United States does. Our racial and cultural issues is with indigenous people, and they were here as long as we were. It's, it's very quickly imported. The reason why Canada, Canada is doing a little bit better is that the immigrants that's imported have been richer on average. But they have 100 percent changed the culture of the country. What do you what do you think that means when I say we have a point system? We pick and choose our immigrants. Yeah, you oh, have I to mean, have a family if you come. Like <laughs> I'm saying, there's rules no, I, in Canada, I, man. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is ridiculous. I, I find Justin, this kind of I find this kind of ridiculous. I mean, I, I do okay. find this kind of ridiculous. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Story, even even, right? even chat's getting annoyed. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's let's recenter the conversation. Point, so, so the 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 liberals, vocal, if you can represent them, classical liberals, the 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 Enlightenment liberals, they're getting trounced by the left. The dissident right is trying to formulate counters to it. I just, the, the question is, how do you win and why do you guys not get along? Why does the left or the liberals not get along with the neo-reactionaries? And why does the neo-reactionaries are constantly, it, it, they're kind of just like the left. They, the liberals get the bullet first. In, in a certain way, you guys are even more pissed uh, off the liberals than the left. So if there is a common enemy, why can't there be common friendship? Okay, so I'll, I'll, the conversation we just had demarcated the line. The neo-reactionaries see the social strife as being a product of inherent ethnic difference. Liberals see the problem, or at least the right-leaning liberals see the problem as a matter of refusal to enact the policies that allow assimilation. And one of Heath's points in his book is that he says, if you are, are going to immigrate to Canada, you're not just changing your geographic location, you're also joining a society. And that means joining the society on the terms of that society. And that that society is allowed to place forth terms on which you are allowed to join it. And we are allowed to restrict immigration on that basis. We are allowed to demand that you learn the language, that you learn the civics, and that you adopt certain behaviors, policies, and ideas when you come here. So what it means to be Canadian is just, I mean, the the language, everyone speaks English in Vancouver. <laughs> That's, you know, mm -hmm. I've been there all the time. You know, the, the population has been completely changed in 10 years, but God, they, they definitely speak English there for sure. Everyone speaks English. Uh, outside of speaking English and following the laws, though, I mean, what does it mean to assimilate into Canadian culture? You have to accept the under. There's a drum beat in the background. Oh, pardon me. That's I. I think um, so. It there's a very serious alarm. question, but uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a question about Canadian identity, and there's a there's a there's a been that question's been in existence for probably a half century, and it was written in the 60s that Canada didn't have an identity. There was no exactly. ex exclusive. Ex 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 so what do you assimilate into? Identity. But I, I don't think that's right. I think the thing that you can, you can assimilate into certain things about Canada, things that are based on um, having a common language, having a common set of values, that. Having, having, what a common, values? having common history. Oh. Would those values be different than yeah. American values? Common history as an immigrant? Yeah. Yeah, how could you have a common uh, history no, if you're an immigrant? No, you, you're grafting yourself into the tree. You are What you're doing is you're saying, look, I want to join your society. There are certain things that make that society function that allow you, the things that are needed are the things that, um, and I couldn't give you an exhaustive list. So it's, it's not, it's, it's not so it's not race, it's not racial. Is it Christian? Do you have to be a Christian? It's, and if it's not Christian, it's do you have to be liberal? Norms, and if it's not liberal, do you have to be norms, what? It's nor, It's language, norms, Values, and when I say norms, that includes such things as as professional norms, career norms, um, uh, n everything from how do we behave at a grocery store to uh, what our moral values are. There is, I couldn't give you a list of all the yeah, things. Yeah, but, 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 but also, so, 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 I have a. So I, I have I have one thing to point out here. 
So this is more or less the line that you get from California and Britain and France. They all say, we expect immigrants to come here, but they have to learn the language. They mostly learn the language because they have to. And then they say, we also have to adopt the, the French values and the French norms, or the Canadian values and the Canadian norms, oh, or the American values and the American norms. I don't think they say that. They, and they're, oh, they all do. They all do. Yes. All the, oh, no, all no, the no, parties say that. That's the salad that. bowl. That's the salad bowl. They what do you mean the salad this, bowl? The, the, the immigrant, so the, an the politicians say this, and the, the norms they want are all the same kind of managerial, lowest common denominator. You know, just be a polite person, be a good worker. The the, the thing, the same norms that your employer wants you to follow, and that, wait, that you wait, get in your on. HR presentation. The, the norms. Okay. Yeah, like the norms, the, the British norms that when the British politicians like Richie Sunak, say, well, they say they need to follow. I don't think they know that they use the actual word norms. They say like, we follow our British values. I think that's the one they use in Britain. But the British values and the Canadian values, they're the same kind of corporate HR values that you see everywhere else. So it's a completely homogenized template that people are expected to fit into with nothing specific to that culture or the other one. The society you're creating by assimilating into a default lowest common denominator and having nobody that has a thicker history or ethnicity in common, that's very different than the one that's forged through hundreds of years of commonality. And, and neo-reactionaries have an answer to that? But, but that's the point. That's exactly, you just touched on the exact point. The point is, and the reason why we limit immigration on the basis is because there's a certain amount of thickness that comes with the Canadian history. There's a certain amount of thickness that comes with the British history. The kind of thing that you can't state explicitly, but that you only get through the osmosis of living in the culture. And if you bring in too many people too fast, you water down the culture so that it can't be faulted and it can't be absorbed. The problem is- If you are a Chinese person running, living in Vancouver, you, will ne you could go your entire life and never meet a Canadian. <laughs> It was from the original said, Canadian culture of there in the 1990s. And, you could go your I entire said, life and never meet one. And, and I said that the, the Vancouver is Canada's equivalent of a sanctuary city, but you couldn't do that in Saskatchewan. You couldn't do that in Regina. You probably couldn't do that in Winnipeg. You probably couldn't do that in Hamilton. The point of the matter is that, that, that you can limit yes. immigration on that basis and for those reasons. And as long as you are limiting immigration, as the 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 people will assimilate, and the best ideas that they bring with them will be brought into the culture at large. The problem is that the people who actually run the immigration thing tend to be leftists, and they tend to actually do the opposite: abuse the immigration system, change the rules without telling people, and then bring in all kinds of people without applying the proper merit, without applying the proper limits, and without applying anything else. So again, but the, the left is winning. The conceptual difference between us is that I think that saying to somebody, you do not have the right race, therefore, we do not want to live with you, is a line in the sand that I am unwilling to work with somebody on. That is someone who has gone, I don't know if that's too far to the right, but that is outside the political tent that I'm willing to build. And you are saying that I should build with them and that I should be willing to build with those people because they are are have a, a view which is historically very common am i getting that right well for instance i don't think that i, I apologize for bringing up this example in advance benjamin but uh for instance i don't think you know i have i have jewish friends who believe in a jewish state and think that it should be majority jewish i don't think that that's a problem i mean when you put it crudely like i don't want you to be in the specific place because i don't like the color of your skin i think that's kind of gross and bigoted and you know, kind of low class, but I don't see what the problem is for wanting to have a country that's a majority of your own ethnicity and yes, genetic stock. I mean, the government of Israel encourages Jewish atheists to move there, even though they have none of their religion, and even though uh, you know, and 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 they they literally, I think they they did this. I think they're still doing it. They still implement genetic tests to make sure that you are of that lineage. And you know, it's a little crude, I think, but I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I'm perfectly willing to work with people who believe that that's a place they'd like to live. You know, Israel still needs to be just to its minorities, and that's 100% essential. And I think that a lot of the things they do are highly questionable when it comes to governing minority populations. But I don't see why just wanting to live around people who are like you is such a moral infringement. If it's, and it's again, I come from multi, I, it's not, this is something I come from a multi ethnic community. 
you know, this is something that I think is just, it's just what people want. They want a lineage. They want something that goes back longer than what's necessary. That's impractical. That's totally impractical to impose in the United States though. That's just totally impractical. Oh, yeah. So I don't even oh, know yeah. why it's an issue. 100%. So why it's is it a big a issue on the new, of hand. But wait, new erectioners? It's a conceptual. It's a conceptual sleight of hand because the reason that the Jewish, uh, that Israel wants to maintain its Jewishness is because the nations around the world want the Jews dead, and that if they if they become outnumbered, what ends up happening is the government gets taken over by people who want the Jews dead, and then all the Jews mm. get killed. That's the wow. I mean, for that, that this is. So, I mean, wait, this, wait, is, this is this is this total hold bullshit. On, hold on. Like they, you're, you're acting like you're acting like you're acting like ethnic hostility is exclusive to Jewish people. It's not. Ev um, ethnicity, for that. instance, Lebanon, for instance, Lebanon would be a good example. I like you know, I never said that. There I never said a, that ethnic hostility was exclusive to Jews. What okay, I great. Said so this was, is a universal that's, concern. That's, then. that's the Jewish concern is their immediate security if the jews were not surrounded by people who wanted them dead i don't think they'd care in fact they probably would not okay look look local i have to correct you on this point the jewish israel is in no danger of losing the majority jewish status in the next 30 years america will definitely lose its majority white status and many countries in europe will lose their majority ethnic status in the next 30 years so if we're talking about imminent like the imminent displacement of the majority culture israel has actually less to worry about than any of the countries we've been talking about over the course of this conversation so you know um, i mean look no, I, it doesn't have anything to do no, with, no no but that's, you know, that's that's i never said that they were worried about see i said i didn't say that that they were just worried that they might become uh the minority group in their culture i said that they were worried about being genocided okay wait and hold on Hamas, Wait, wait, hold on, because this is important. But we're getting the in the Hamas weeds again. Has it explicitly in their constitution, but here's the point. If, you can say genocide. Right, like, I get to say that too, if right? The like, neo, if the neo-reactionaries are sitting around saying that they're genuinely concerned about the carrying out of an imminent genocide of white people, I would take that concern a lot more seriously. But what you said was their concern was they wanted to live around people who look like them. There's a big difference between saying we need political solidarity to survive on the one hand and I want to live by people who look like me on the other. Those are two different justifications and you're alighting the difference between them. And no, I want to know which one is it. Are the well, neo-reactionaries worried they're, about They're both imminent... concerns and they're related to each other historically. I'll, get, let me, I'll give which you an example that it? actually illustrates this. I'll give you an example that illustrates this. Uh, if you're, I mean, you sure certainly heard of South Africa, right? Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that there is a concern about ethnic cleansing in South Africa or Zimbabwe? Oh, to yeah. Take a previous yes. Clearly. Oh, okay. So it's, that's it's legitimate. Clearly. I mean, they yeah, just, legitimate. They just have you said, heard of Irania? They just said, they just said, I mean, okay, they have just you heard released of Irania? A, a political people saying, no. But the, but the, is, the board thing you, is I, 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 should, I would encourage you to have a blogger called Conscious Caracol on your channel, uh, Benjamin, because what a lot of what people did when all of this rhetoric started, uh, you know, ramping up, like kill the boar stuff, what do you think they did, local? They got together and they bought a whole shitload of land and all of the Dutch Afrikaner moved to this land so they could all be around each other and escape the crime that was being obviously perpetrated against them because they were of a rival ethnic group. And because they had their own little enclosed area, there wasn't the constant threat of being moved in on by a large group of other people. <sighs> the, wanting to, this is a defense mechanism, historically speaking, for just the kind of violence you see in South Africa. When, when so, the government yeah, falls apart, this South becomes Africa. a problem. When South no, Africa, hold on. Was, South you, Africa was not no, living in South Africa you're, ten years what ago. You're act, what you're saying, what you are doing, is inserting that the implicence of the existence of different ethnicities in the same group implies that they are going to eventually wind up breaking apart along ethnic lines, and that one will want to dominate the other. That's what you're saying, or along racial lines. And I'm saying that that does not Naturally need to be occurs, the case. Yes. It and does I'm not saying need to be the, the case if you take actions like those that are commonly explored in neo-reaction if in as in singapore you have a strong government come in and just tamp it down and make sure that everyone is in line and in order then you can stop these 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 racial animosities from bubbling up so but you're, saying, you're saying that this is, this is you're this. saying this is naturally incurring and you're saying it's along racial mm -hmm. and ethnic lines and i don't think so i think this is in group out group 
And I think it incurs among in group and out group along the lines of um, in, in group and out group has a group, damn nasty habit of appearing along racial lines. That, that's a, well, that's be for a, historical. That's re- part of our own flawed human nature, but that's just what happens. No. You know, I. What can I say? I think, right, I don't I like mean, it. I mean, I mean, who's the in group and out group for white progressives? Who's their out group? It's white conservatives. Mm-hmm. Their strongest out group is white conservatives. The Hutus and the no, Tutsis look that. almost inseparable from each other. Right? Sure. So I mean, I, you can come up all, with exceptions. This is all, no, 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 no. The, the point I, mean, I, I, of, I understand. Like, in group and out group is not always along racial lines, but it tends to it erupts along that, and that's a concern, right? And what, okay, I, so look, what look, I'm look, saying is, I, I keep on, I, keep, salience, I feel like I keep on having to like separate the theory from my own personal opinions here. The salience of race can be gotten rid of, and how can I put this? The salience of race is the question here, and I don't think race is inherently salient. I think. Race becomes uh, becomes salient when we make it so. It's not like the difference between man, males and females, where literally men can't give birth. And I'm sorry if you get a strike for that, Benjamin. You can you could strike that from the record if you have All to right, keep the YouTube channel up. But but the point is, there's there's I'm nothing sorry, inherent. Yeah. Thanks for the race conversation right after my COVID ban. <laughs> there's no there's there is absolutely no reason why race has to be salient and what i mean by the race realist is that these people continuously are looking for reasons to say that race is salient and therefore we have to make policy along racial lines they want to separate they want to be to to use your terminology live around people who look like them etc no, etc the and i, I think that all this is let people bullshit. do what they want the only thing That's i, I not have not proposed policy. No, not not you. I'm saying neo reactionaries at large, having them pop up in my mentions, reading the discourse very very carefully. They're they're not just proposing letting people do whatever they want. That is not what is being proposed. They want a monoculture. They want to create a monoculture. They look at at uh, the the kind of trolley comments around Israel. Are, are indicative of the fact that like, I want a majority white culture because I want to live in a majority white culture because I like being around white people. That is the claim that they're making. So that is what they're doing. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, can, can, can you look between, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I, I want to be sensitive. I really apologize for this going so much on the racial thing, you know, but, but given. But that's where the line is drawn. That's the yeah, line. Yeah, apparently that's where you that's draw where the, the line. I don't see what the difference between that and ethnicity or stuff is. Like it's it, people well, divide along that, different groups and you know, they'll want to live in those groups the, and we have to manage that. The difference between race and ethnicity is that uh, I can adopt the beliefs of another ethnic group if I cho- choose to. I can't adopt the biological features of another group. And race judges people by their biology, ethnicity, um or better yet, culture judges people by their beliefs and values. And that is the difference. I can adopt different beliefs. I can adopt different values. I can't adopt a different skin color. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you could, it's pretty hard to discard your ethnicity and adopt an entirely new one at the deep level that we're, we're talking about or that's been relevant to these conversations. I mean, I guess you could you could hypothetically do it if you studied your entire life and just gave up your, your past ethnicity like a racial doles or whatever. But virtually nobody does that because changing your ethnicity at, a high, at any age before like 14, after 14 would be virtually impossible possible would be incredibly difficult to do which is why no one really does it outside of people who are trying to bury their past you know so i mean common beliefs and like when you say ethnicity you talk about a thick thing what other things did you have in mind if you don't mean beliefs and values what else is there poetry i'm talking about i mean first of all a common sense of history which you mentioned is 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 a is a good example so for take it take for instance the deaf afrikaners right when they look back and see history they see themselves as like a pioneering people that that colonized the south africa and, and that fought off other groups that wanted to destroy them one of them was the Zulu. Another one was the English. People forget about that one. And so when, when an Afrikaner looks back in history, he sees that as a heroic struggle. Whereas somebody who's of a Bantu persuasion would see that historical thing as, you know, even though his ethnicity probably wasn't involved in those battles, he would see it as a form of colonization. 
There's also things like poetry and food and custom. Uh, you may not notice, but cultures have very, very different ways that they that they mate and they raise families. And, and this, this is impossible not to notice if you live in an area that has radically different cultures attached to it. And you could say it's like, it's, it's, it's not just appearance. It's, it's deeper than that. And I'm not saying like, again, I, I can't, I feel like I'm broken record, like saying like, I am a believer that we can make multiracial societies work, but to pretend like, you know, you can press a button and, and get rid of these differences because we've decided that, you know, to notice them is a horrible crime. I think that's unrealistic. And I think that you, you, what you end up doing is you end up punishing people for noticing things, which is like, it's what we're doing right now. We're punishing people for noticing differences in how people behave. And that seems to be fundamentally unjust to me. I mean, it's it's not well, hard to see that 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 Chinese people and and Nigerians behave very very differently, and it's not just in 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 their external features. Well, it's I, not changeable again, either. Well, it's not changeable. Well, it's like we so it's we've tried to change this. Inherent? We don't know how much of it's biology. We don't know how much of it's cultural. But it's very hard to change. That's what we know. And almost nobody does change it. There is a very, there's a very fine line between noticing a difference and then imposing difference, especially around the discourse of power, of rule. So that's, enough, that's one question. So I can see the liberal okay, point wait, of view hold towards, hold on a second, Wokel. I can see the liberal uh, trepidation towards the neo-reactionaries who were, who were once talking about uh, when Charles Haywood's, I'm going to completely demolish the left. I'm going to completely just totally destroy their entire project and adjacent to charles haywood is people uh, spouting off about like the difference between racial groups and stuff like that so when when you mix observation and power it's no longer just an observation you can't just hide it behind hide behind an observation i don't know why the liberals can't look at that stuff or get so trepidatious i mean i understand the trepidation but i don't know why they have to batten down on it and i don't know to what extent that weakens them in the long run from from the common enemy enemy of, of the left taking over every institution and then doing whatever the left wants to do to segregate people i'm going to quote Searle here professor Searle is the uh local i'm giving you a two-minute quote limit in this conversation so okay he says this You cannot, this, our ideal originally was to emphasize the individual within the universal. Now, neither the universal nor the individual is emphasized. Rather, you as an individual derive your identity not from your individual efforts at self-definition, but rather from the group to which you belong, and consequently, you are representative of your group. You cannot escape having identity through ethnicity, by the way. When the radical students in Berkeley attacked my department because of its lack of representativeness, one of my colleagues pointed out that Professor Searle, is part Cherokee. I am indeed part Cherokee, or one very small part Cherokee. But then there was a debate. Why was he not counted before? Well, said my colleague in the pages of, one, of the student newspaper, Professor Searle prefers to be thought of as white. I find that ridiculous. Professor Searle does not want to be thought of in these categories at all. There is something slightly absurd about our conception of race. My department chairman hoped and prayed that I would list Cherokee as my ethnic identity for affirmative action reasons, but to such a concept of race is quite bizarre. Recently, there was a big debate about whether Jefferson had an affair with his uh, African-American slave, Sally Hemings. A close look at the evidence reveals that she was a small part African-American in the way that I'm an even smaller part Cherokee. The point, however, is that race is one of the few notions that really is a social construct in this country because you are defined by that which you or other people suppose can be the most hated about you. And if you are one small fragment of Cherokee or African American, then you count as Cherokee, African American, or whatever. Anyway, I disappointed all hands by refusing to insist on my Cherokee identity. That's the liberal view. I prefer not to be thought of in these categories at all. I don't think... The, the neo-reactionary, mm -hmm. what, is what Benjamin just said, the imposition of race, or the idea that, well, you say, well, a Nigerians appeared differently from China. Well, take a Nigerian guy, a family, and then a Chinese family, and then let them live both in, say, Finland, in a homogenous area of Finland for four generations, and then let's see how much of that difference sticks around. Because I'm pretty... More, you I'm might pretty, be I'm, surprised how much sticks around. Uh, four generations... Are they intermarrying with Finnish people? Uh, they're assimilating into the culture. But they're like intermarrying because there's only one of them, right? 
So in four generations, yeah. it'd be very hard to tell. But hmm. well, okay. I, so the, look, again, look, I, I don't know. I mean, like, look, look. You know, this this picture of of perfect assimilation into thick cultures is is very nice, and I think that if we can pull it off, it would be awesome to do. And I I I, I really like the idea that some people want to take this on. But not everyone has to get into this project of of trying to import radically different people and assimilate them into cultures that are very, very different from their own. Oh, if you take a group of Nigerians and you move them to Finland, you know, it, 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 we've already done this experiment because there are Nigerians living in Finland who have been there for about two generations and they haven't assimilated into Finnish culture. So, you know, experiment failed and maybe, you know, it's the, the, the magic number is four generations. But, you know, at, at the same time, I can forgive people for, for looking at the successes of this project and saying that I, I don't necessarily want to pursue this and I don't see why we, they have to. And, and it's, it's not hard to see why people are envious of Israel because they see a country that's proud of its own ethnicity and that defends its own ethnicity. And then they look at a cu culture like South Africa, which, you know, became a minority and then I mean, were persecuted from that. And they're saying, and everyone is asking themselves, listen to this local, because I think you get mystified by this and I don't know how you're mystified by this. If you're a person that's going to become a minority in the next 30 years, which is a damn lot of people of indigenous European persuasion. Right now you're asking yourself, how can I be less like South Africa and more like Israel? Because Israel is gonna be around in 40 years and a lot of these European countries just aren't. Their native cultures are gonna be completely replaced by immigrant cultures because there's almost no assimilation occurring, regardless of how much we would like to occur. Okay, the difference between Israel and South Africa is who they're surrounded by. South Africa wasn't going to get overrun by its neighbors. Israel is. South Africa so did get overrun by its neighbors, Wokel. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? This. The that immigration was, uh, that of that was, country that was, completely that was, changed the demographics. That, that was, and they are yes, surrounded was, by enemies. Wait, 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 wait. When I said South Africa... Do you know the history of South Africa, Wokel? No, no, he made yes, a mistake. Yes, I do. Dave. I, I phrased slipped. that. Okay. I, I made Sorry. He admits I, it. That Sorry. Was a slip. But here's the point. But here's the point. But here's the point. When, what Israel has to deal with is is a sort of pan-Arabian problem against against Jews, right? And I've already said that the Boer in South Africa are in a very similar situation, so that's understandable. I said that already. But the point of the matter is this. What you're dealing with in America and what we are dealing with in Canada and what's being dealt with in Europe is a very different set of circumstances. And that set of circumstances also is being used as a Mott and Bailey because even if they weren't under threat of being replaced in the next 30 years as a, as a majority by, or even if they weren't to revert to plurality status, because they couldn't quite be a minority, they'd be plurality. But even if they weren't, the, the neo-reactionaries who I talk to, when I ask them and I say, look, what if you were in no danger of that? What if it was still a 90% white country? Would you still feel the same way? And the answer is always yes. Because, because they believe that it's inherent culture. to being ethnicity and race. Because the, right, because they be, want inherently, they believe inherently in the monoracial <sighs> thing, and that's no, the problem. I, no, I, no, no, look, look, I, I know people who have these opinions who are literally married to non-white people. <laughs> like this, this idea that this is just like a rank that that these feelings are o only stem from a rank bigotry. Uh, I didn't say they only on stem from a rank It's bigotry. not. It's just not. But I'm, but I'm trying to correct you. Like what I'm trying to say, local, is that although you find these these distinctions based on ethnicity to be crude, and in some sense, you no, know, they are not ideal. They are based on a core set of concerns, right? So, for instance, like if I'm French, right, I want you know, let's say that I'm in a in a, in a culture, like I'm I'm in a village that's you know ninety percent French. French and it has a very strong French culture. If you move like millions of Polish people into that village, that culture will be much less French. Now, I could be married to a Polish woman and still realize that that observation is true. Do you see the distinction? Like, I, I know people who are married to people of these races okay, but what and they is, still think that these concerns are, are What are do the neo reactionaries want to do about it? That's the question. That's what makes the liberals wary, the Enlightenment and liberals wary. And why is salient? 
you're, you're, you're treating it like you say, like race is salient and then people will break it through ethnicities and then therefore there will be conflict. Like that's always the story that gets told. And the model of South Africa and Israel are two extreme models. And that's the one they say, which is always a part of history. But people who well, they now consider to Zimbabwe be part of a single race. Well, like, but the people that they now consider to be part of the same race and ethnicity were a hundred years ago part of would have been considered to be separate races that, and ethnicities, and they assimilated fine. Yeah, and so but there's the as much as change the over time very power. slowly. Races change. The boundaries between races change very slowly over time, especially if you have a common religion and a very strong king. Now, like the, the idea, like we're using neo reaction sloppily here. Ben asked yeah. me a question. Neo reaction is is a is, is a is a practical political perspective on politics that's skeptical of democracy. It happens to intersect with these racial concerns, and it's used as an example. The reason why they come up frequently in things like Curtis Yarvin's earlier writings, and much less so his current writings, is because these dynamics with race demonstrate one of the core vulnerabilities of open democratic societies. And that is racial, demo uh, racial demagoguery always has a political advantage. And that's why it tends to ramp up over time. That's why you have all of this anti-white rhetoric ramp up as whites become increasingly a minority, both here and in South Africa, although South Africans are in much more danger. Based on the 1960s model, you'd assume that since there is less racism, then there'd be less anti-white, big anti-white rhetoric. But in fact, the opposite has occurred. As whites have moved increasingly into a minority, the anti-white stuff has amped up. That is because there's a political advantage, democratically speaking, for driving this stuff. That's sort of where neo reaction comes in, and they say, "Well, we just have to make sure." that everyone gets out of this process. We don't want anyone to stir up racial prejudice or, or dissatisfaction. And, and one of the solutions to do this is the solution that the Austro-Hungarian Empire took, which was essentially to have different areas, even different towns dotted around the map, be just different places where people could have their own little enclaves. And I think that's one solution. I don't know, if, I, don't, I think it's inappropriate for America right now. Another thing that I know Yarvin talks about a lot is if you end democracy, then you will end racial politicking because the king will have absolutely no interest in in, in supporting these kind of de dem demagogical. Uh, because they waste uh, time; know. they don't produce anything. They waste that time. The king would want. Yeah. The king. Yeah. The king also does not want to have large swings in the demographic <laughs> composition of his country, because people th that brings in a large population of people who aren't loyal to him. And and, and yeah, but there is a speaking. The immigration to this to the West is politically driven. It's driven by parties who want to benefit at the polls from having these people here. And it's also driven because we need to have a constant increase in the population so that we don't just default on, default on all of our debts because they're all based on this idea that people have more children. So if you got rid of the debt bomb and you got rid of the political impetus to bring in new voting blocks, then all of the logic for having like what is it? England's like a million immigrants a year. It's insane. There's not even enough infrastructure to deal with these people. That entire motivation yes. for these mass swings yes. would go away and people would learn to live more or less where they are and build in their own communities and, you know, and mix slowly over time and form new ethnicities, right? Through the process of ethnogenesis. This would be a naturally occurring process. This whole metastasizing thing where like the entire dem demographics of countries swings to one side or the other in 10 years, that's what's really Really, really dangerous and that's what's being driven by this liberal democratic order and so but, why but are oh, the wait I hold on welcome welcome let me let me let me just let me just like let's try to land the plan here because we're almost we're over two hours so um I, I want to know the liberal, the, the enlightened liberal perspective on this or the counter to this why neo reactionaries get the gall of the liberals so much and that the liberals just distance and try to gatekeep them and try to police their behavior uh, on on a lot of different vectors but specifically on race so how did what's the liberal frameworks um solution to to the problems of racial conflict let's say or or just how do you rule a multi-ethnic multi-cultural society once the liberals create that how do they rule it rule it I want to touch on a couple of things here, just just to be real quick. Um, again, 
a lot of what Dave said in that last bit is stuff that's already found in liberal philosophy. So Joseph Heath, for example, talks about the reasons to limit immigration having to do with assimilation. Um, and so I would, I would make, make that point first. The second thing is that, again, immigration is a hot topic, and it ought to be, because you can't take in endless numbers of people at endless speed and maintain social cohesion. That's clear. Um, but I think that what the the from the liberal perspective would be something like this is racial salience and racial conflict had been decreasing steadily by every measure until something like the mid two thousands, and then it begins to climb up again, and racial tensions begin to increase. And if you wanted me to trace that back to where that begins, you could probably trace it back. Well, the initial academic paper on it was Mapping the Margins by Kimberly Crenshaw, where she explicitly lays out a program for making race the salient issue in politics and for using race as the linchpin to do politics from, to treat races as interest groups. She, na she nails this out very, very specifically. And she uses, she says, intersectionality as a postmodern bridge between as a bridge concept between postmodern uh, theory and progressive politics. And she very, very explicitly lays out how this is to be done. That gets picked up. Uh, that's critical race theory, by the way, is where that comes from. And that gets picked up and run with by the establishment types. And so it it's is in line quite with the civil rights me, uh, doctrine, though. I mean, that's in line well, with the power invested in and, and well, hold on. Wait, 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 more wait, more of the on. point than that. More of the point than that. This is our original contention because you say like, Kimberly Crenshaw invented the idea of using races as interest groups. Races have no, always been interest that. groups. I didn't say that. Uh, what I said was that the sale that well, races can be, but they aren't necessarily. But the point is but that they, they vary that commonly sali in history. Sali racial because they're proxies for different groups. They're proxies on the basis of the fact that races yeah, probably totally emerge agree. evolutionarily. Right. So they're proxies. But in, in what Crenshaw is saying is, no, she wants to use race on the uh, for reasons related to post. I won't get into the whole paper, but she wants to use race or a postmodern understanding of how race functions to use race as a way as a as a standpoint from which to do politics. The salience of race was going away, and postmodern epistemology and postmodern theory brought it back for cynical reasons. I'm saying don't accept those terms from the postmoderns and lean into them and say, well, this is always a process. Blah, 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 blah. The solution is to rip apart and destroy the ideas which led to the re to the to making race salient again. And can can liberalism, can Enlightenment liberalism enforce that? Well, Searle, Searle talks about this, and Searle actually would agree with some of what Dave said and said that part of and Searle says that part of the problem is that liberals have been, and the professors in particular, have been utterly spineless in dealing with this stuff. Liberals have not had a spine in pushing back on the postmodern uh uh, the the postmodern and the neo Marxists and the the woke fusion, which is the alloy of postmodernism and critical theory, they have been utterly spineless against it. In fact, they have stepped aside. And in Searle's uh, defenses of the Western rationalistic tradition, in his book on the campus and crisis from 1971, he discusses how how all of this plays out and why it plays out the way that it does. I don't think that leaning into the uh, into the framework that's been handed to you by the postmodern left, you gain anything at all. Because what's going to end up happening is playing a white racial ID politics, the id poll of, of the of identity politics from the white right will result in, in about six weeks, the Democrats or the political left will instantly drop their intersectional lens, go back and say, we're doing class-based analysis now. We run the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, and we're going to lean on that old union power. And, and they're just going to pull the whatever people, whatever white working class power you had up from under you is going to be gone in a split second. So it's not just strategic. So it's, it's strategically stupid and as well as being con conceptually, um, flawed because the conception of race that's powerful right now is the postmodern conception of race that comes out of of crenshaw now i agree this postmodern conception are, looks incredibly similar to pre-modern conceptions 
It, I mean, it this, might. This, this, and, these grievance yeah, polls that are like the most common thing in history, they occur so yes. frequently. And so th the idea yes. that like, you know, this, this idea that my race is poorer than yours, therefore your mu race must be oppressing me. You find this everywhere and nobody needed Krim Burley Crenshaw to teach this to them. Humans naturally think this. They have eyes in their head. They look outside. They see all the rich people are white. They see all the poor people are black. They immediately think the white people are, are oppressing them and the same thing is true if it's germans and jews or or chinese and malays but, 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 or or Hutus and tutsis it's always the same thing this is a very common human mode and, and to pretend but like you know this comes from like this comes from an academic in the 80s this is this is a reality of how humans oh, wait, operate wait, wait. we need to build governments okay, wait, to confront don't, this wait, let's, not get, 60, let's not get let's not get the 80s and 90s but wait, wait. If you go, if you go from say, from say, from the 1930s to the 1970s, you're actually seeing um, the, the the Jim Crow laws go away, right? We have an increased mobility for Black people. We have increased economic opportunity. The racial stuff is beginning to go away. It really you, is. You also see what the complete is, destruction of African American communities in in the in, in the fires yes. of the 60s and 70s. And, and, yes. and, and the and, beginning and of a that ghetto to... that basically that basically mm -hmm. arrests all economic development for a variety of reasons. When you arrive in and, the 2000s, you still have yes. the same divisions, and that's even with affirmative action. But but the the internal problems of African American communities relating to family structure and things like that is separate from the question of 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 how would you put this is separate from the question of whether or not racial salience was decreasing and diminishing because it was and kimberly crenshaw made an explicit plea this is how we're going to bring it back and then they executed their plan on this is how we're going to bring it back they talk about how they're going to bring it back they draw a plan for how they're going to bring it back and then they go out and they bring back racial salience that is what they did now you could say well that's a very common human dynamic and they're leveraging a very common human dynamic maybe they are and in fact look using skin color as a proxy for in-group out-group is probably pretty effective if you can get people to think in stupid enough categories i I'm yes, saying reject the yes, yes, and I'm saying reject the stupid categories. Then how do you build a coalition? So, so I, I, if I can clarify, Ben, uh, to bring this back together, there's a frequent thing like what I, I don't want to speak for any reaction because I feel like I'm speaking for people like Garvin, but I think our perspectives are not so dissimilar. We want functional societies, both multicultural and monocultural, and this is all to procure that. But what we see the fundamental mistake as being is that na societies naturally slide down into chaos and ethnic infighting. That's their natural trajectory. And unless there's a force pushing back on that, then it will naturally go into civil war and chaos. I think the difference between me and local is that he sees what happened recently as people actively doing something that kicked the machine into motion. I see a restraining force just being removed. What we see in the 2000s is a bunch of more responsible older people retiring out of public service and being replaced by people who either don't care or who go who are basically drinking the Kool-Aid on on equality of opportunity stuff that uh, rhetoric that came out of the 60s. And so all these restraints went away and people followed their natural instinct which is to be incredibly tribal and to be which, incredibly which crass restrains. and to go to the lowest common denominator. So, I mean, this which was restrains. always, in my opinion, this was always going to happen. This was always going to devolve in this way. The thing is, is that our system was just wasn't strong enough to hold this tide water back. Which restraints were removed? Uh, like I said, it's a, a lot of people just retiring from the system. You're talking about the Great Awakening. What was restraining that back? What was holding them back? The, the restraints that were in place were restraints on objective rules, objective values, objective truth, objective standards of merit, and all of those things were removed, broken up, and subverted, and deconstructed by postmodern theory, which ejected them from the system. No, they were the subverted because the people who believed in them retired, and that a bunch of ambivalent people and some ideologues of the variety you're talking about came in to replace them. 
Oh, no, 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 no. George Fredrickson is very, very explicit in the administrative literature about how they're going to do this. And he sets out a plan that gets carried out by activists to change the language so that it could be used in law. And they're very explicit about how they do this. It doesn't look it doesn't take a lot of people. If you can get 10 or 12 activists in a group of 100 to make the rules and make the changes and go to the go to the meetings those people can change the culture of an institution very very quickly eldon eisenach lays out 27 people who are responsible for the care for the creation of the progressive hegemony in the in the 1910s and the 1920s sure there were probably people who were ambivalent and didn't care and were crass careerists and crass bureaucrats but there absolutely was a changing and there absolutely was a changing of the guard but let's be absolutely yeah, clear about this a changing can, of the guard and most people yes, came in but what, but why was yeah but the people who came in afterward had certain beliefs and where did they pull them from those people were taught in an education system that had been again subverted by people like paulo freire and henry Giroux. and i can show you what they're being taught in the schools in the education oh, colleges no, I know they're being taught how they're this. being brought up right but so what, they're being, stuff, they're, what they're being the, taught is that this stuff is the way to achieve the promises of civil rights and equality between the races and and yes, and, and they're, being, they're, they're being and, and being, they're they're being put Local, they're give, they're given a proposition that's obvious. The races are not currently equal. What went wrong? And the only answer they have is that there is some racist conspiracy, you know, some conspiracy of oppression behind everything. They have answers. That's, and to be quite yes, yes. frank, the liberals don't have answers to this question. They have like oh, we'll have oh. a meritocracy. How, how do you and, achieve and racial is- equality? Like imminently. This is. What do you mean imminently? Like, are you putting me like on a thirty-day deadline? Next, <laughs> yeah, in the next ten years. Like, look, it's been it's, how how long has it been since the seventies? It's nineteen. It's it's been like fifty years. Fifty right? years. Yeah. Fifty but the, years. The point that I'm making. This. The point that I'm making is that is that. All of the standards were eroded, and the people that who were brought in, who were brought in, I don't think they were ambivalent. I think they were incompetent because they were taught in a milieu that didn't demand merit and didn't demand objective standards. So they had subjective standards, and they brought those in. These are people who are very, very explicit about the fact that their politics comes first. These are teachers who are very explicit about the fact that their politics comes first. And those teachers are taught how to aim for positions of power, and they are ruthless, ruthless in their attempts to create hegemony and that is the that is the pool out of which the people who run your institutions are drawn if you look at your legal theorists the one place that conservatives have held the line is the one place where we dumped a huge amount of resources into keeping something like a conservative worldview alive and that was in law schools through things like um the federalist society which is why we still have some conservative jurisprudence but in every other area in the humanities in every other area of business administration we have been absolutely absolutely conquered by postmodernism. And so what happens is people who come in, they are true believers, they're taught. Conservatives are, to be fair, weeded out because you're just not going to quite get the grades to get into grad school if you say the wrong thing. And all of that leads to where we are. That is not going to change on neo-reaction because neo-reactionaries don't have the power to actually do anything about it. Well, neither okay. of us have yeah. power immediately. We're talking about what we would do no. with power. And so the, the right. thing is, what, right. is, 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 what converted these people, I mean, we kind of agree that what we saw was a changing of the guard where, a new, where an old religion went out and a new religion came in. But what I'm trying to emphasize, Wokel, is, is how natural this changing of the guard was based on previous things that we had already said. A, we didn't have any religion. B, the only public religion we could impress on people was this kind of John Lennon's imagine we'll all be equal and equally diverse. And then when we looked around and we saw that we weren't diverse or equitable, leftists asked a simple question. He's like, why doesn't this work? Why hasn't it worked yet? And the only salient answer that came out of why there isn't equality of outcome was the one that these people, you know, the the Paulo, uh, I can't pronounce their names. You know, it's the, really? it's, it's the Kimberly yeah. Crenshaws of the world, right? It's yeah. the it's the Derek Bells, it's the Bell Hooks. They're the ones that had the answers to this question, and liberals didn't. And that was the only religion that could be taught in the schools, and therefore there was a religious changing of the guard. But what I want to emphasize in all of this is that this was always going to happen, given the preconditions that we had set up, and the preconditions were no religion an incredibly racial diverse uh-huh. society, and then one where we promised that we could atta- attain equality, but didn't. And that promise was an implicit religious promise. 
those conditions made the woke oh, revolution and the so. postmodern revolution necessary. Those three. Once you have those, what's the way out? Someone would have said this stuff if it wasn't no, no, no. if it wasn't Derek Peller, Kimberly Crenshaw. Somebody would have said this. It's anybody no, could think I of this. That's stuff. It naturally suggests is. itself. Yeah, but that's who cares how who said it? Like how it, it's here. Where do we go forward? It is here. What is the Enlightenment liberal solution? going forward as opposed to the neo reactionary solution neo reactionary from what i get is that neo reactionaries want to be very pragmatic about power take the power yeah, and then if, want, if, if yeah. and we need to fire everybody in the system and we also need to make it explicit that we will not promise equitable that basically it, it, it has to go to a system that's more like a system where People can privately manage their schools and their businesses and promises about races being at parity in certain institutions, I don't think can be properly made because we can't deliver on them. I'm sorry. I don't think that's possible, right? Th that we sounds very liberal. That sounds very alignment liberal, like like low government okay. power. I mean, it happens to intersect the with the pre-civil rights idea of liberalism and freedom of association. Because I, because I think that's a very practical way to manage a multi-ethnic society. Because I think that, you know, I think people are going to, what we don't want people to do is ramp up huge, big racial movements and try to take over the government. What we want them to do is we want them to care about their local community and fostering, you know, all, all of the, all of the metrics that were completely destroyed in the seventies in the African American community. Why, why is the African American think, community? Yeah. I don't want to ramble, but go ahead. You know, I, I could go on I, about this, I, but. I, I think that the problem is that you keep saying, well, this is, was naturally going to occur. When Paolo Freire first wrote the Pedagogy of the Press, it didn't make a splash. Nobody cited it. When Henry Giroux got a hold of it, he made it his business to go get a PhD. And then he worked with Ira Shore and a few others to start up a, a journal series through which he got over 100 people tenured in the 80s. If each of those 100 mm. people goes out and does one-tenth of that over the next year, that's a 1,000 people. If those thousand people do it, uh, uh, one percent, that's two thousand people getting okay, tenured but, well, in I'm education colleges. Well, before we go on oh, the exponential route, on, but but I, I need to stop because there's a counterexample. There are a few scattering of reactionary and conservative professors around this world. Why don't they just do the same thing? Why don't they just do the exact same thing that Paulo Freire did? And, right? and they and, can't. And, well, not when Henry because Drew the system did. disincentivizes it. Oh, no, no. Henry Drew had a hell of a time getting tenure and was originally denied tenure when he tried to get it. The professor told him, no, he wouldn't hire him because of his ideas. He went hunting around and hunting around and hunting around and hunting around. These people were on a religious mission. They were zealots. And this is literally all they did for their entire lives. And but this you know is the point that I want like to make. Ideas? Who did like their ideas or bureaucrats working in the Equal Opportunities Commission or bureaucrats working in HR departments because their ideas exactly played into the ideology you would want to have running one of these systems that manages diversity inside large corporations. And because of the civil rights legislation that had occurred first in the 70s and then later in the 80s and 90s, these organizations were mandatory. Therefore, you had but a bunch of mandatory doesn't... government institutions that were looking around for some ideology that looked like this but, because it fit perfectly but, into their Jerusalem, affirmative action policies. No, Jeru's point is about pedagogy. Jeru's point isn't mostly about race. He almost says nothing about it. I'm talking Critical about these ideas generally. Later. And I'm, I'm saying talking about that these ideas idea, generally. But hold on. What I'm saying is that what Jeru said is that education should be political and that we should make it about leftism. That's what he said. And he got hundreds if not thousands of people tenured that doesn't just happen on its own those are people those are activists who are going out and making things happen it's not structurally determinist by but preconditions what, but, but, because but, everything but is preconditions local. i can argue this there are incentives to do this for right? liberalism but hold on then i could go back and say look christianity set the preconditions for liberalism so really christianity oh, yeah, yeah, liberalism, yeah, causes... liberalism is a offshoot of christianity absolutely Yes, but but then what we end up with a situation where it's, this is structural determinism. Then we're just no, no, well, there's nothing the we critical, can do about it. The critical the critical break was was going into universities and saying that you need to. Well, I mean, it's going to all organizations in society and saying that the goal is to have a, the goal is to have a certain parity of outcomes. 
a certain equity and outcomes. This was essentially the job of the Equal Opportunities Commission initially, and, and the idea of disparate impact that flowed from those organizations. This is what people like, uh, you know, Christopher uh, Cull will talk about. This is what you know, Richard Hanania talks about. These are what create the incentives that make these ideas so lucrative. The idea, everyone has kooky ideas in the academy. The ones that win are the ones that get research funding, the ones that get support from the administration. And the reasons why they get support from the administration is because they fit like a hand in a glove to the diversity things that they're required to have by the civil rights programs that were implemented in the 70s and 80s. Look, I'm not saying that the civil rights movement and and the the um what would you call it the court judgment or the the opinion what's it called the opinion that wins not the dissent the majority the majority opinion? the majority of, uh is that yeah the one um yeah not the dissenting yes the majority opinion in griggs v power company that established the doctrine of disparate impact that said that disparate impact could be used de facto as evidence of racial bigotry or of, of mm -hmm. racial unfair treatment. Right. Yeah, I'm not once saying you that have there weren't that... other incentives. I wasn't, I'm not saying, but once you have that, that doesn't get you all of the woke stuff through all of the education system. That doesn't get you the takeover. There was a very, very clear planning. Isaac Gotsman in his book, The Critical Turn in Education, talks about, he says, where did all the 60s radicals go? They went into the universities. There was a long march through the institutions. They write about this obsessively, and you can see the fruit of it. You can look at the citation okay, chains of what's whoa. being cited and what's being created. You go back to the 1920s, you can see the citation chains that's creating the text, that's creating creating the books, that's creating the curriculums. The citation, I agree with the citations, but, but, but local, the, the, the thing is, is that if this I'm is a being manager, done by activists. Oh, this no, is being done the by activists. activists. The, act, the, the activists are, are, are welcome. The, the activists, because if I'm a manager of a department that has a diversity requirement and I can't make it, I'm looking for a theory that explains how some deep-seated implicit racism is responsible. Yeah, I like want that. to find that. I need to find that because if I have that idea, then I'll be able to justify why we're in such a horrible position when it comes to diversity. I agree that there's this citation chain. I don't contest that at all. I'm, I've actually I've read these people, well, not all of them, but you know enough of them, and I've certainly spent enough time in academia. But but I think that you would have activists aren't going to be able to will their way to reverse this. And the reason why they can't will their way to reverse this is because it's being driven by law. It's being driven by incentives that come down through the law. And it's the cooperation between the activists on one hand and the managers on the other that actually drives this process forward. And if you only have one hand, this thing does not become the ideology that's taught in the Coca-Cola boardroom. I don't, the I, I don't understand. I don't under I the lineage and 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 what we we've covered the lineage on this on this channel plenty. What's the Enlightenment liberal counter to this issue? The Enlightenment liberal counter. It, okay, so the very first thing that the Enlightenment liberal is going to do is have to strike down the the so use the, the presuppositions assumptions. Uh, no, no, the system needs to be. How do I say this? The system needs to be cleared out and fixed. The subjective standards of the postmodern and critical theorists need to be gone. Those need to be destroyed. Okay? The problem that you have is that the this view has hegemony in your institutions. The critical race theorists were very clever in figuring out how to use, um, as Chris documents in, in America's Cultural Revolution, how to use the administrate, how to use clever rhetoric to attach their vision of critical race theory to administrative power. And they were able to conjoin those two things. And they were able to provide what looked to the people who were already coming out of the progressive era, the kind of progressive liberals that occupy these upper level institutions and these bureaucrats who come out of progressive liberal institutions, they were able to say, hey, look, this looks a lot like your civil rights movement, like the next thing. And they were able to very cleverly attach. That link needs to be broken. The thing that you are struggling against is a set of ideas that have captured your institutions and have captured your society. You need to be able to do something about that.
You need to be able to show why these things are wrong, and you need to be able to be ruthless in the destruction of them. Liberals in the past, as Cyril says, have been utterly spineless in, in their willingness to, to defend against this. They have been unwilling to say, sorry, that, that thesis that you just put forward is not good enough for tenure. No. They're not willing well, to do that. Well, that's hard because all the professors are already on board with this stuff in these departments. Oh, oh So that's yeah, not going to happen. It, I, look, it's this well, stuff has been well, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 stop, one. stop, stop. Stop, stop. Th th that is, uh, in term in internally, fixing the universities internally from within as a single professor is going to be a difficult task. But if the, if the leftists can march through the institutions, I don't see why we can't, for one. For two. You can't because leftists were hired into I, the universities. Well, hold on. The, part two is to create competing institutions. I think we're going to go through a decade of institutional failure. And because we're going to go through a decade of institutional failure, I think the universities and the institutions that have been taken over by this are going to fail and fail repeatedly and fail disastrously. Setting up that institutions according on. to merit. I just setting up the dollar to go as well, selfishly speaking. Setting up institutions that operate according to merit and according to liberal epistemological ideas is going to create competence, and that kind of competence is going to be powerful. The second thing is that where it is appropriate, yes, you do need to wield some form of political power where it is appropriate. You can't defeat an idea with power, but what you can do is you can prevent it from instantiating itself currently. So, for example, in the province of Saskatchewan, where I'm from, they just passed a law that said that um, teachers are not allowed to keep, if a child wants to change his pronouns or change his gender or whatever it is, you're not allowed to keep that from parents. That's one law they just passed. Now Saskatchewan moves very slowly. It's like a giant ship with a rudder. That's how it operates because of the kind of people it is. The fact that they made that turn means more turns are coming. They're wielding power to stomp this stuff out. That is good and appropriate. Setting curricular standards is good and appropriate. The kid who got the Gadsden flag on him, firing the administrators who did that is good and appropriate. Firing people who are incompetent is good and appropriate. Getting rid of DEI officers is good and appropriate. So, Getting so rid I'll, of I'll, people... I'll... I'll cut in here with my own suggestions uh, very succinctly. Look, there's two ways to handle this. I totally agree with you. Parallel institutions is one way. But if you're going to take on these universities, you just got to fire everybody. You have to completely reset them. Uh, trickling in laws is not going to do anything. Because oh, oh, they're, they're, they're not bound about, by these laws. And, I'm talking you know, about K-12. K-12, and you bring it in, you bring too. them in it. You bring it in and you enforce... Oh, Saskatchewan will enforce the laws. Watch. Mm -hmm. uh, will New York enforce Watch. the laws? Will Washington enforce the laws? Will California enforce the laws? Okay. Will okay. York, but, now will, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, those are the major population centers. Those are the major population yeah. centers. Yes, yes, those, yes. those are the places and where the new generations are going to come from. So you get a few provinces and, and the rest of the country goes in the woke direction still. Right. Oh wait, the, wait. But you have to I just take this thing out. I just said applies to those things too. The enforcement mechanisms too. If they refuse to enforce the law, you're fired. And we hire Who's new people to them? enforce the law. Rufo or says, says there's nothing. Fire. You fire them. And fire them if they don't enforce the law because you don't know until they do it, right? Because these people tend to lie about what they'll do or what they won't do. So you ha you can't tell whether they're telling the truth because everyone will say I'll enforce the law. So what yeah, you do is you put the law forward. You, you put the law forward when, if they don't enforce it, they're fired, and that's it. So we're going to need another bureaucracy to watch this bureaucracy and then fire them. The, I mean, the, it becomes this tenuous chain. If you know they're not going to enforce the law, you, see, you need to replace the guys by firing them. Hmm. And you need to, right, you need to you reset to these things at, are. at virtually all the levels. I mean, you know, like passing yes. a law but, and then expecting, you know, ideological superintendents to enforce it. You know, who's going to report on them? Their ideological teachers? Like, you know, maybe you'll get some no, lips no, of TikTok no, videos. You no, know. no, you need also, you also, as as I wrote with with Christopher Rufo, we wrote a, a pamphlet on this. You have to take over all the school boards as well. You have to take over the school boards. You have to go through each and every one of these people, find out who's carrying the stuff out, who's carrying out your DEI trainings, what DEI trainings they're doing. You have to go through, you do have to clean this stuff out of the system. I'm not disagreeing with you, but there are methods and ways of doing that. 
There's appropriate standards according to which this is done and corporate ways of going forward. You can't just go forward and say, well, we're firing everybody because if you did that, now you have – so there's two things. You could abandon the institutions and then you abandon all the trillions of dollars of capitals to leftists who are just going to use that to further entrench their views. So you can't do that. If you try to clean out the institutions by firing everybody, you empty them out, you have no institutional memory, and who's going to run them? Because let's remember that conservatives, we don't have a bench of conservatives ready to step into these institutions. I kind of see us as kind of like an army that doesn't know how to take a fortress. If you can't replace these institutions, then you're not going to be able to enforce it with the granularity you were just describing. What you were just describing, the granularity of micromanagement that would require would require a bench of talent equivalent to just replacing these people. That's what I'm trying to express. Well, I'm, I'm, so you should you should and, start uh, with replacement, and if you can't do that, don't bother trying to stand over the shoulder of every single one of these teachers and stop have, them from doing look, the wrong thing. You know, the I, left took it's the just institutions. Like, take the power or not, you can probably look, get away with look, keeping. A lot of these jobs don't even need to exist. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. I would, I would get rid of a lot of the administrative jobs, the useless administrative jobs. I would fire all those people immediately. Obviously, the stuff that doesn't need to be there needs to go. Your DEI administrators, your chief diversity officer can go just off the door. The person who's running your gender studies program can probably just go if you're in a K-12 school. Tenure might be a little bit of a different thing. But also keep in mind that universities are very difficult to run. Universities are very tenuous and delicate institutions. Now, the left has brought power into them and has abused their authority in respect to those institutions. Like, why do Getting we them to be running prop. Like, what do they do? Like, they, there's engineering research that goes on there. There's some science research, but like the majority of these departments that are soft, I mean, they're doing nothing essential to the running of this country. If they went down for a few years, like a COVID break, no one would notice. And in that time, you could completely reconfigure them. You could find talent from other places. You know, you could do a lot. You could have a lot fewer universities for a little while. You could sell them to private religious groups that would use them for their own purposes. <laughs> We're splitting hairs a lot here, but I don't know how the neo reactionaries get along okay. with the liberals and the liberals get along with the neo reactionaries. Uh, I think there's been some things. Like, it, there's, there is, uh, I'll, I'll go first here. I think the, the subject of this talk is, is largely because the the neo reactionaries want to have a broader space for discussing ideas because a lot of necessary realities are probably quite offensive to people in locals camp that 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 revolve around things like differences between groups you know that we don't know exist but we have to discuss the possibility of existing like the possibility that certain communities might be better as homogenous and certain communities might be better as multicultural both have to exist and I, I think that my I, my idea of well not my idea but the idea behind no enemies to the right that comes from the straw st steel man rating of Charles Haywood is we deal with these ideas that are not explicitly immoral in the mode of intellectual discussion. So if I hear an argument about human biodiversity, I don't get the person fired. I examine the data. If I hear an argument why you know we should support more intentional communities that are monoethnic, I go, I wouldn't want to live there, but that's an interesting idea. Let's talk about whether it would work or not. And also, we give people the ability, I think this is essential, we give people the ability to construct their societies how they want, which is naturally going to cleave statistically around ethnic boundaries, which will correlate with racial ones. That's not to say that we keep people apart. And I support people who want to build multicultural communities. But I think that we have to have this open attitude towards these further right ideas and these nationalist ideas in order for us to kind of come to terms with, I mean, first of all, just to kind of like touch truth. <laughs> first of all, there's, there's a dimension of that. And, and also, and also to, to, to look at to effective ways at organizing human communities. Hmm. And, and I, I think that there's a place for, you know, liberalism in that conversation, but I think it has to answer questions. Pardon me, Wilkos. Go ahead. So I see this very differently. I see the boundaries. Uh, I, th I see the fundamental question being one of boundaries and where do we police the boundaries? I think that the neo-reactionaries are far more into the racial boundaries as inherent and necessary 
than uh, they let on. And I think that most of the liberals are saying, look, once you're leaning into biological and racial explanations for a huge array of phenomenon, that's a problem. How do it we becomes a problem because it's not true. How do we oh, know it's not true? Oh, I think... Well, well if I'm you want to have so... that discussion, we could have it. But, but I can say, well, for one, a lot of the things that they say can be are, are wrong just on the merits. Like when someone says that the average IQ of a black person in, in America is 80, that's obviously false, and we have the data to back that up. So that's one example, but I couldn't go through. If you want me to systematically go through the entire thing, I can do that. But when someone says, I want to look with, I want to live with people who look like me because I want to live with people that look like me. And that's a first, and that's a principle of mine. To me, I say, that's ridiculous. I don't, that's a, how can I say that? That something is motivating that. And I don't when know, you man. Say, I, I grew up with, I grew up with, the- Grew up with a bunch of kids whose parents said they all wanted them to marry other Jewish people. I was not offended by that. I grew. I mean, it's fine, right? People want this. Judaism is no. uh, Judaism is 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 as much. And they were fine with Jewish else. atheists. If you wanted to, in case you were confused about this, right? Hmm. It was not about. Well, if, so, if you said going, it was somebody, not about reading the Torah. Okay, you know, but, so yes. But, 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 but how do you how but, do you police these finish, boundaries? Liberal finish. liberalism well, doesn't seem to have like what? what how finish, do you police the boundaries? Well, hold on. Let me respond to what Dave just said there just briefly for a moment. If someone says, I want to marry someone culturally similar to me, that's one thing. It's a different thing to say, I want to marry someone who racially looks like me. Those are not the same thing. And that's the Mott and Bailey. To me, they're both arbitrary. You know, I mean, and they, they correlate so, so strongly, too. If I say I want somebody who can make Spetzel, or I want some, so let's say I like redheads is an acceptable desire, right? If you said I want to live only around redheads to the exclusion of sure, anybody why else, not? I have problems. I would say that's a ridiculous why? thing, and I would have a questions about it. I would have a why. Why would you care? Why what would you care point? if someone wanted to live around redheads? Why would you care? If they want to live just around people with red hair, like in the redheaded league from Sherlock Holmes, why would you care about that thing? I don't understand it. Because if you want to give that, because if you're, how can I put this? The moment that you're you're bringing that in and you're wanting to bring that in and give it a political valence, then it becomes an issue that I have to deal with. And the oh, neo reaction has a political valence. Political yes. Balance. Well, because the, so, it's the, so it's the political valence. It's not the desire. It's the political valence. And that's exactly what we're trying to separate here. We're trying to say, you can live how you want to live. We're just trying to isolate this from dangerous political movements that could disrupt the order of society. And, and you know, people want to people want to continue the genetic line. They want to continue their culture. And so there's going to be a lot of people who live among people who live like each other, right? But I agree. It's the politics that's the problem. Since we're doing politics, and since we're talking about the right and left as a political thing, things that are non-political I don't care about because we're doing politics. It's like in a church. Your non-religious activities that have nothing to do with religion don't matter to me. Whether you like bowling or guitar playing is irrelevant. But whether or not you live a certain way, whether or not you follow the rules of the religion do matter. And since we're dealing with politics, the question is, what kind of politics are we going to be doing? And when someone comes along with particular political ideas, and I think those political ideas are are evil, I'm allowed to say I'm not going to work with you. And I can do that to my right. If someone to my right holds horrible ideas, I can criticize them publicly. Because I think criticizing that is not right. the issue here. That's nothing to do with no enemies to the right. I criticize nationalist oh, ideas. No, no. Charles, Charles, Charles uh, Haywood in his article very explicitly says you should not publicly criticize anyone to your right because you it gives should a not publicly participate. You should not publicly participate in a cancellation campaign. You're saying that we have to take this idea, which is nationalism, and then we have to put the worst possible face on it and assume that the guy is hateful or assume that anyone who holds it is hateful. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying that people can have these opinions and still be good people, so they need to be part of our conversations. That is what no enemy to the right means. 
And to me, when you say no enemies to the right, it really sounds like I'm not allowed because what's the way that it's been used and the way that Haywood has defended it is that you can't criticize publicly. And he didn't say no cancellation. He was clear. And so I don't want to... Now, there might be a difference between your view and Haywood's view. He's not here. And maybe I need to talk to him about that at some point. But talking to you right now, I... When you say no enemies to the right, that is explicitly saying that we cannot do this to my right, but I can do it to my left. And that means that one, the criticism can only go, the criticism insulates only criticism to the right and not to the left. And the second thing it does is it delineates the criticism or the cancellation or who my enemies are based on their position on the political spectrum and not based on truth. So I can get smashed by new reactionaries, but they can't hit, but I can't hit back. I feel like we've That's lost ridiculous. the distinction between no local. We keep on confusing disagree with cancel. Okay. Can, if, can if, you if, 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 well, if, if Charles Haywood means you could never disagree with a person to your right, that is an incoherent statement because he has disagreed with people to his right. So he's criticizing himself. He could not possibly mean it. What he means is that you don't jump on active cancellation campaigns that are institutional in origin. Like was going on with Thomas Accord, which is why that was the the motivating example in that in that article, and uh, and and the thing is, I, and the reason why it doesn't go to the left local is because the cancellation is going from left to right, not from right to left. If this were the Red Scare in the 1950s, then maybe we would have to maybe you would have to say this <laughs> in another dimension. But right now, it's all going the opposite direction. My answer to that is no enemies to the right or left to me is not about specifically institutionally canceling, but it's about drawing boundaries. And I don't draw boundaries based upon your position on the political spectrum, whether to your right, my right, to my left. I draw my boundaries based upon what I believe is true. Yeah, I mean, what, what, the, the your political boundaries or your boundaries of discussion? Discussion is about truth, right? Political boundaries is about who you ally with, right? Uh, my political boundaries are about who I'm allowed to I uh, who who I'm allowed to ally with, on okay, the one so, hand. Yes, for instance, atheists. Then, I disagree with them that God, like atheists, believe God doesn't exist. I disagree with them, right? But That's I can truth, ally with them, right? Okay, but is that an offense to truth? Is your allying with an atheist a, a crime against the truth of God's existence? It's not. If right? they're it's trying not. to. But but it's also if if they were trying to make that part of the political program, I wouldn't ally with them. If they wanted to make atheism part of the political program and say we're going to bring in atheism and give it a political valence, I would not ally with them. If they said we want you to think, do you things, think they're going to give atheism a political valence. Of course, if the atheism is allowed, then it will have a political valence, right? If atheists are allowed to exist and not get canceled, then atheism will have a political valence. Just as people with, you know, Jared Taylor type opinions are allowed to hold, you know, offices of teachers and not get fired, then that will have a political no, I mean, difference. I mean, I mean, you used specifically, to get, you used to be able to get fired for being an atheist. Right. Specifically atheistic ideas. If they say, I want to be on this team, but I also want to use our political vehicle to advance atheism. No. Well, nope. dude, I mean, like, I, I would argue that most atheists, including James Lindsay, have said things like that. They've been huge enemies of religion throughout their career. Uh, James yeah, Lindsay James, was well, all part off, of that new atheism thing. Yes, he was. I, yes, he was. <laughs> and if James, if James wanted to use anti-wokeness to advance atheism in particular, then we would have a problem. But he's not using it to advance atheism. He doesn't say, let us use our political movement to advance a particular form of atheism. He actually doesn't care about that anymore. And his, his new atheistic writing he now considers to be cringe. But if he did, if his goal was to advance atheism, and if his goal was, as he says, if his goal was to use anti-woke so thinking to advance atheism, that would be a problem anyone who wants to use my political vehicle to advance something false is out so if, this, if the person we were talking about came on and said oh man i i thought that a few months ago but now i think that all those tweets i made were cringe you know i do think that you know we should have the ability for people to defend their own heritages and live among people they want but i wouldn't force that on you that would be fine that would be fine then if you said that I'm I'm willing to give Pedro Gonzalez the benefit of the doubt, yeah. And we all saw what he just went through. I don't know what you're talking about, but sure. Pedro Gonzalez 
is was brought out and Breitbart actually for whatever reasons people think this was a a, a DeSantis a Trump feud but uh, a, a pile of stuff was released about him from 2019 and 2020 where he was saying anti-semitic things and all the rest of it and he released a tweet saying yes I went down that rabbit hole I don't believe those things that was wrong I got sucked up into it I'm sorry for that and I would like another chance and I'm willing to say you know what if he no longer believes those anti-semitic things yes I think we should give him another chance and by the way if Thomas Acord was able to give an account of why he said those things and why he no longer holds that we should segregate students in education Yes, I would be willing to give him a second chance and be willing to have a conversation with him. I think we absolutely should give people a way back. I don't believe that yeah. um, saying that I can't I, join, you can't join my political coalition right now means forever. Yeah, I just I think we need to be very. I think that with all this anti-white stuff, I think people are naturally going to push back by insulting other groups back <laughs> and they're going to try to assert their own identity and because they're attacked on that basis they will assert their identity in the words of whiteness and you know those records are going to be out there for most people who are in the conservative movement who are under the age of 25 i guarantee it i don't know as a capstone to my position i i believe in neo reaction so we can defend both monoculture and multicultural communities and make them ordered and thriving. I believe that groups change over time and that interracial marriage is part of that, but also that people have the right to preserve their own groups and use whatever weird demarcations they need to, to ensure those boundaries. And if they sound silly to me, like only wanting to be around redheads, that's not for me to decide. And it seems to, it seems to me that I would want to give people space to explore these ideas. And for this reason, and for the reason that uh, these things are being used by our enemies to fire people, I'm very, very skeptical at using this as a moral standard, especially since I don't see it imposed anywhere outside of the 20th century hmm. across Christian history. Well, cool. I just don't, I just don't understand. What's the principle policing boundaries from your point of view? That's, that's just my question. How do you, how do you know when a line that's being drawn in the sand is something that you don't want to draw or have anything to do with? Um, well, I, I like how Searle talks about this. Um, he says that with respect to language that we typically have a core and then as you get away from the core, the boundaries get fuzzy. And so I don't think you can draw a set of lines that are have crystalline purity and universal cap um, application. The boundaries at, towards the fringe are always fuzzy. But I think the point is that everyone draws political boundaries. I can't tell you how many times I've been told I'm not on the right. But they can hit me because no one beast to the right doesn't include me because I'm apparently a leftist. And so... And that's one of my reasons why no enemies to the right. Look, if I'm already your enemy and I'm on the right, well, then I'm going to hit to my right because I'm already your enemy. Um, and so I think that when you're policing boundaries, that the goal of policing boundaries is you have to have a movement. Your movement has to have boundaries, other because if it doesn't have boundaries, it just includes everyone. And so, like, the liberal atheist who's transgendered shows up and says, yeah, I want to join. Well, but uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you know? How do you know those boundaries? Is it the direction you're heading? Or your enemy? Well, no, I think there's two two tests. One is you have to have an, an, an epistemology. Um, there's epistemic boundaries. So, for example, if someone tells me that they're going to adopt the postmodern epistemology, out, right? Anything that postmodernism or critical theory, gone. Because those So you don't discuss it, you just boot people. people. Well, no, 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 no. I will debate people who do that. But in, in my political movement, when it actually comes time for action, we're not bringing in postmodernism or critical theory, because that's my enemy. My enemy is postmodernism and critical theory. And those are the things I'm going to go at. When I say postmodernism, by the way, I mean philosophical postmodernism. And by critical theory, I mean the neo-Marxist tradition leading back to the Frankfurt School. If you're using those epistemologies, you're my enemy. I'm going to attack you, and I'm going to bring blistering attacks on your epistemology, because those are the two epistemologies which broke the left. There was a time when the political left in the United States, when Democrats were sane, and they're not sane now because they got broken by those and, methodologies. And atheism is not your enemy this way? Why is atheism not your enemy this way? The way that postmodernism is. 
postmodernism and atheism are different. Atheism isn't in itself. Yeah, but why is atheism it's not your enemy exist. in this way? In this what? just the way you said. Well, apologetically, it is, and in religious contexts, if so, if I'm if I'm forming a religious community, I wouldn't allow atheists in my religious community either. Is Except atheism in the is political. There is, and this is a critical difference between us. There is no difference between religion and politics, and there never has been. Atheism is a political endeavor. This is what's driving it. The death of God in politics is what's driving this, and this is all a consequence of that. Uh, if you want to look for the roots of this thing, don't look in postmodernism, look in atheism, look in secularism, look in stuff like that. Okay. Mm, are you meaning secularism with a capital S, or are you meaning secularism with a lowercase s? Because there's I'm a meaning secularism all of it. with a capital S. Because secularism with a lowercase <laughs> s just means that we're not going to have an officially sanctioned state religion. Because if you need an officially sanctioned state religion, that's secularism. If you, if if you're saying if you're saying that we need it officially a then then no. If what you're saying by secularism is the cultural movement in which um, uh, the underpinnings, the transcendental underpinnings which are held in place by God are removed, and that creates a problem, then then there's something there. But atheism, but but atheism but has political atheism, consequences, correct? It has political consequences, right? Sure. It is therefore political. Therefore, the same things you're saying about oh, postmodernism no, 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 apply to no, 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 no. Yes. Lots of things have political consequences which don't make them primarily political. I can make all kinds of decisions which might have downstream political consequences that doesn't make them political. Because if that's if, that, if atheism is political in that way, then so is everything else. Having a child is a political decision. Getting married is a political decision. Being heterosexual is a political decision. What job yes. I get is a political decision. Could all of these things have downstream decisions, have downstream uh uh, consequences that doesn't mean we make politics exactly, the primary yeah. arbiter but that doesn't mean that we make pro politics the primary arbiter or the primary standard by which we judge things when i said epistemology I mean, the reason is because epistemology truth is at the truth is pre-political truth comes before politics if your politics comes before truth it doesn't matter what your politics are they're going to go off the rails epistemology is at the root of everything and if you're going to use broken epistemologies it doesn't matter whether you're christian atheist buddhist or muslim you're going to wind up going crazy places because your epistemology is wrong now and atheism is not a broken atheism, epistemology is atheism, atheism not a broken isn't epistemology. epistemology atheism isn't an it's, epistemology how how can atheism not affect your epistemology you're right, it's more than epistemology, but how can it not affect your epistemology? Because an atheist, like like Searle says, can agree that there are absolute standards of objectivity, even if he's not able to ground them. There's a separate, there's a difference between epistemology and ontology, which is at the, I mean, that was the mistake of, of, of the logical positivists, was they thought they could reduce everything to facts and logic. But Searle doesn't think that. Searle thinks that there are transcultural standards and there can be objective standards. Now, you might say, well, how does he ground them? And he would say, I don't know. We're going to have to figure out a way to do that. But he can, if a guy like that comes along and says, I agree that there are objective standards, then yeah, I can, I can work with that guy because he's, now he might not have a way of grounding them. And I would hammer him for that in a religious context. But in the political context, as long as he's willing to grant that there are objective standards, I at least can work with him. But if someone brings in postmodernism and critical theory, they're, ipso facto saying that there aren't any um, transcendental standards or objective standards for epistemology and that you can't work with. If I came to you with a postmodernist and he said, well, I have some weird theory that I'm not showing you off screen that shows you how you can have objective standards and still have this epistemological school, then you'd work with them. Then he wouldn't be postmodern. Okay. <laughs> like See, I, 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 this, is, this, is, this is why, I mean, like, this is why I, I kind of agree with you, Vocal. I kind of agree with you. But I mean, like, this seems arbitrary because I think, like, you know, I, lots of people who are atheists don't actually, very few people who are, are atheists act like they're atheists. And this is something that I bring to a lot of my uh, European friends who are technically atheists. They certainly don't act like they're atheists. And I would say that they're functionally not. Uh, but but this, is, this, is, this is just the reason why I don't think that you can just take these nominal ideas and erect boundaries around them so firmly. You know, I'm I'm perfectly willing to work mm. with a postmodernist as long as I think he's a good person and the proximate political goals are are to a good end that will help humanity and help humanity's relationship with God. And the fact that he has contradictions in his worldview, you know, will work on those. I guess that's kind of my opinion. Hmm. Um, I don't think that's going to work because. 
I mean, we saw what happened with the right post or with the left. Postmodernism broke that easily. I mean, postmodernism was able to sneak in and just be like, bang, 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 bang. And rip it to shreds. It had no problem. Postmodernism Dave's argument is that everything. That's what it does. It's inherently deconstructive. Well, because it was so politically it expedient. So it was. If someone says I'm it was expedient to the bureaucratic system. Is designed. Yeah, I, I see postmodernism and atheism in its modern form being more or less different stages of the same fundamental death of God process that was kicked off in. Yeah, you know, I think it had earlier origins but was kicked off in the enlightenment and then came to fruition in the 20th century and because i see them as sort of extensions of each other i try to be charitable to both and you know i extend the charity to kind of crude nationalism if you want to call you know that stuff in the accord affair right i i, I want to be you know no one has the answers to these questions yet and people all want to rebuild communities. And so uh, I think that the, my enemy, as I see it, is a system and is a lack. It's an absence of belief. It's an absence uh, of wholeness. And then there's a, there is an industrial system that keeps that absence in place that, that you know, we call man the managerial, the managerial total state, as uh, I think R.N. McIntyre would call it. But, but that's how I see it. And I, I don't think that 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 these these philosophical labels are, are useful as means of excluding people, unless they correspond to a distinct action, or, you know, unless they advocate for an action that is in itself immoral. And living around people is not immoral. Uh, marrying certain people rather than others is not immoral. Uh, I guess believe, not believing in God is immoral, <laughs> but hmm. but I, I think, you know, I, I try to be charitable even in those cases, right? If it doesn't have an immediate impact. And I think that when you bring in postmodernism and critical theory in that worldview, you're bringing in diseased minds, as Douglas Wilson says, and diseased minds make for lousy decisions. They make bad calculations, and you want to keep those people out of your leadership, and that's the reason why you punch right. If he wants to vote for me, fine. That's great. But the problem is when you bring in the postmodern relativistic, when you bring in their view of language, when you bring in their epistemology, you create serious, serious problems for yourself. And part of the problem is, I think, in all of this is everyone's trying to define the boundaries and decide, because there's two different boundaries that you've been shifting back and forth, and I don't know if you're doing this on purpose or not, so I'll just bring them out. What, what are they? What, who, I'm going what to are do, they? who will I do politics with? And who will I have discussion with? Who uh, will I formally align with in politics is one question. And who am I willing to have a civilized conversation with is another question. And those are two separate boundaries. My boundaries for who I'll have a discussion with is much wider than my boundaries for who I'll have a, who, who I'll do politics with. Uh, yes, but then there's also the boundary of who you just like attack by any means necessary by going after their career and stuff like that, right? Like that's that's I've an additional boundary. Of being that. But I don't. But okay, I don't. Okay, great. But we know we're not we're discussing this in the con, right. and that was Other where it people. came up, right? I mean, right, it, right. we can't divorce no enemies to the right from the origin of it as okay. a discussion so, over somebody so who has. Okay, so let's call the second boundary the discussion of, let's say, the people who are kicked out of the discussion are the people who are kicked out of the institutions and therefore fired from their jobs, right? So there's the political boundary, who will do formal politics in, and then there's the other boundary of who we're going to kick out of polite society by firing them. Those are two separate boundaries. Would you agree? Yeah, of course. I mean, they're all separate boundaries, I guess. I mean, I'll have a discussion with anybody. I probably wouldn't discuss, like, the legitimacy of something like Child don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Let's okay. say phrenology. Something <laughs> phrenology. Know, yeah, something that's it. Beliefs. That's it. That's it. Phrenology. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> God, this is so hard to talk about taboos and can't talk about taboos. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, like, yeah, sure. I mean, but like politically, I mean, that, but isn't that totally dependent on the thing? Like, I don't believe in. So I'm, I'm against separation of church and state, but like if you believe in separation of church and state, but you know you're you're against the the transgender insanity, I'll lie with you. Like there's feminists, like there's turfs that uh, that are against like this trans stuff, and I'm allied with them, but they're total progressives, right? So like they support there's abortion. Certain 
on on a particular on a particular issue, you might make you might say, "Look, I'm going to vote with you on this." But in terms of 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 anti woke political movement, you might say to certain terps, and I have, "Look, you've accepted the critical theory in postmodernism, just not when it catches your thing that you like." And so I can't ally with you. And I've told some of them that. And I won't ally with them if they're bringing the postmodernism and critical theory. I don't care that, well, you're anti-trans, good. But that's just because you're, when the revolution so you're voting with to the, eat your thing. What does ally with them mean? If you're voting with them and you're, you're, you're coordinating a political campaign, but you're not allied with them? Oh, no. I would, I would support a campaign. I wouldn't attack them for their support of my campaign. I wouldn't, for example, if uh, one of these postmodern okay. turf feminists said, I'm going to vote for you, I wouldn't say, no, don't vote for me. I wouldn't do that. But in terms of she said, look, I want to ally with you and I want to work with you on this, I would say, sorry, man, because you're bringing in all the assumptions that I'm attacking. I'm not going to tell you you can't vote for me, and I'm not going to intentionally push you away from voting for me because of that, because of that one thing. I will accept your vote on that issue. But when it comes to actually we're going to movement build now, which is a lot thicker of a concept than just you happen to be giving me your vote on Bill HBC 515432, which bans males from women's locker rooms or whatever it is, that much thicker concept. No, I'm not going to bring in a turf who accepts postmodernism and critical theory because that's just a person who is only upset because the revolution that they're fully on board with accidentally ate the thing that they like. And no, you don't get to be fully supportive of the postmodern critical theorists, all of the woke stuff. But hold on, we're going to stop it right where it reaches my thing. Like, yeah, no. I'm not sorry. so 100% on this distinction, to be quite honest, Wilkel. it You know, I, I think that... Uh, I guess if it was my community or my church, I'd certainly be a lot more discerning. But in that case, I probably have a lot more particular standards that wouldn't be, you know, that would be they'd be much more specific to my in individual persuasion, right? The beliefs of your political community are a product of the people that you let into it. And so anytime you bring someone into your political community, you're bringing in their beliefs. And you have to ask yourself, which beliefs am I bringing in? And which beliefs are we going to forward and advance in our political movement? Yeah, so so if I bring atheists into my political community, then atheism is part of my political community. If it's got a political valence and they're using the vehicle to ad advance atheism, then yeah. Like if James Lindsay said, why are you doing this anti-woke thing? And he said, my goal is to advance atheism, we'd have a problem and I'd probably cut him off because we're not doing that. But that's not his goal. His goal is not to use anti-wokeness as, as, a, as a Trojan horse for atheism. You have to draw lines. And again, look, the lines are fuzzy. If you want to get finely granular about yeah, it, the line will Yeah, they're pretty fuzzy, man. I'm fuzzy. just going to say that, right? They're, they're very lines fuzzy. Are fuzzy. Hmm. Well, no, this one, lines are... Of, of the lines we've discussed, this line is particularly fuzzy. Uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't think so. Look, if you're bringing in a political idea and you want to give something political power and you want to do, use your politics to advance something, that thing had better be something that we can agree on. That seems like obvious... And we can't agree on atheism, so you can't use the party to advance atheism. That seems obvious. In the same way that you can't use the party to advance abortion, or you can't use the party to advance, I don't know. Christianity. Uh, well, yeah, no, can we can definitely use the party to advance Christianity. Christianity. You can? Well, things okay, we great, but then, then James no, is gone, right? I'm, I'm, teas I'm teasing. I'm, we have to remain non-denominational. I don't think we use the government to advance the Small religion. Small as secular. Yeah. But I, I feel, I think what you're attempting is fundamentally important. So, I mean, Christian in the culture, Christian culture, formerly secular government, and neutral along the lines of epistemology. Uh, there, is, there, can be no such, there can be no such, I do, this is another tenant of near reaction. There can be no such thing as secular government because or there can be no such thing as immoral government. There is always, there's no such thing as neutral institutions. There will always be a guiding ideology. And if it's not Christian, I said, I said, it will be something I no, I said epistemologically neutral. I didn't say ideologically neutral. We still agree okay, so there's still things to be advanced. There are still things that you have to hold. Like you have to hold to objective truth. You have to hold to objective standards of truth. You have to hold to objective epistemology. You have to hold to certain tenets of what is good and what is not good. Those absolutely exist. It's not a free for all, yes, but it's epistemically neutral. That is, the standards are applied neutrally. That doesn't mean there are no standards. It just means that the standards are applied neutrally. So, for example, the law of the excluded middle is applied 
neutrally to all arguments. Logic is applied neutrally, math is applied neutrally, but you can't say, well, no neutrality, therefore math is up for grabs. I don't think it is. Hmm. When I say liberal neutrality, I mean, I don't mean that... Um, so to borrow your math analogy, no all mathematical systems have certain axioms. There is no axiomless mathematical system, period. They all rely on that. And so when you talk about a government, there can be no secular government because it has certain foundational moral axioms that are distinct. And those axioms will play out in real time in how the institution forms itself. There also can be no ideological neutral education either. So what, what, and this is a core element of how wokeness occurred is we created a system that had no moral structure about the formation of what's right. And in the vacuum, all of this idea, all these secular platitudes about equality and equity, and and you know the destiny of 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 creating this human being that you could form yourself, that you gave yourself meaning, that flowed into the absence of this ideology and became what could be properly described as a new religion, because there can be no secular government or education. Well, I don't think that. So when you say secular, that just means non-religious. So when you're saying yeah, there's no be- there's no view from nowhere, I'm not saying that there's not there's a view from nowhere. I'm specifically have said twice that we do have objective standards of morality, and we do have objective standards of epistemology. I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm also not saying that we don't have that education is a free for all where anyone can have any standards at all. By by virtue of the fact that you're educating somebody, you're teaching them something and not teaching them something else, and you have to do that on the basis of something, and so you've got to have reasons for teaching one thing and another thing. How do you arrive at those values with a neutral epistemology? Yeah, I, I'm wondering so that about that again? myself. How do you How arrive do you, at these values? About- Through a neutral Neutrally. epistemology. Yeah. Oh, because your coalition um, does not have values in it. You said it was neutral to that, right? Even though it had this, these, these. No, I didn't say it was neutral. But I said it was epistemologically neutral. I mean, that means that nothing gets to be. How can I say it? We don't decide what is true on the basis of what is politically expedient. We decide what is true on the basis of rigorous epistemology. That's what that means. We apply epistemological standards to find out what is true. To find out what the values are is moral epistemology. That's something different. That so if I'm in a coalition, and I live in a very diverse area, you know, and then there's a lot of Muslims around here. So if I'm in a party that's half Muslim and half Christian, and we take political power, like whose values are going to dominate? Are we going to, pr- was one side going to prove that they're right? What's going to end up happening is that, well, first of all, you're going to do moral epistemology and not say science, because science can't give you values. That's not how that works. So I, I don't think I said science in that entire do, statement. No, I know. I'm, I'm making a point for everyone who's watching, because I don't want yeah. anyone to think that I'm a logical positivist. My point is that you're going to arrive at a set of moral values in order to form your political coalition. You're going to have certain values and certain axioms that you already agree on. And within those, you're going to say, look, these are the axioms that are most important to us, and those are going to be our core axioms. And then you're going to have other axioms that are less important as you move out. And then you're going to have things which are kind of tangential. Those core axioms are going to form the basis for what you do with your truth. When you find out that a certain set of facts is true, your moral axioms are going to tell you what can we do for example if i tell you that the murder rate is five percent if your moral axiom is i love murder then you're going to say well how can we incentivize more of this so that we can increase it if your act if your moral axiom is more is murder is bad you're going to start looking around the policies yeah, I, I, I understand how axioms that. work at local but so, my problem you know, is, is that you have a coalition that's got two but you have a coalition that has a fundamental disagreement and base moral axioms up front it's going to create a problem that needs to be resolved in some way, and that's what well, I'm pointing. They're going to have certain. They're going to have certain moral axioms, and they might not be able to form a political coalition. But what you might do is, if you're a liberal, you might say, "Look, on the things that we disagree about, if we can stomach it, we can leave those things to individual decisions, and on the points that we agree, we can legislate." Like, I don't need to legislate quiddity or the Islamic concept of marriage, but what I can do 
or, or the Christian doctrine of headship in a marriage. I don't need to do that. Here's what I can do. I can sit with the Muslims and say, look, we have a common idea about that gender transition is wrong, so we can take that axiom up and we can use it. Politics is in some sense pragmatic in that oh, I'm regard. I'm a big believer in pragmatic politics, but you're going to teach something. If you have a unified, if you have an integrated system, you're going to have to teach something in schools. You're going to have to raise children believing in something is right and wrong. And one of these worldviews is going to dominate and shape the opinions of the next generation. And, you know, that, that is a political disagreement there, right? That is that, that ultimately controls what culture the next generation will have to an extent. Obviously, a simulation, again, is very limited. It will definitely determine what values they have and it will determine how they relate politically to their environment and in, in the next, you know, 50 years. So I don't think you can, you know, all of these ideas that we can kind of kick this under the, I feel like we're kicking under the rug this is the most important things, right? And, hmm. you know, I mean, I, people are right to to kind of look at this and say, you know, if, if, if 50% of, of the new people come from a culture that values something different than mine, yeah, you're right. The polity of your society is going to fundamentally change. And I don't think they're necessarily wrong in being upset about that. And, you know, I, and so I, I think that we have to kind of like understand that this is the dynamic that plays out in both societies where people can be happy and and, and live their lives and organize their lives, uh, you know, accordingly in, in their own separate piece. And, and, and a, a lot of that I, I don't take an issue with necessarily. But the issue that I take, again, with the neo-reactionaries is people keep saying, well, there are all these wars happen over ethnic conflict. Well, yeah, when you value the ethnicity, then yeah, you can have conflict over it. But if you devalue the ethnicity and, and reduce the salience of race, then you don't have conflicts over race. Race for a long time wasn't salient in many cases. It was culture or which nation you belong to. <clears throat> Now, that's not always true, and I know there's going to be a bazillion people in the chat being like, well, what about race and there's proxies? And yes, I know, I realize that. But we have, we can make decisions to judge people on their character and their values, and we can make choices like that. We don't need to. And again, with the rise and advent of the internet, you can enjoy, if, for such re if, if you care, you can enjoy your poetry and you can enjoy your music and you can enjoy your songs and you can have your family you can raise how you want to but you can get along and buy eggs and milk and bread and groceries with the guy across the street from you who agrees with you on 90 percent of how life is actually lived i would be willing to bet if you talk to the typical muslim and ask how do you actually live your day-to-day -day life it's not going to be a lot different from the very conservative christian this is not hypothetical, local. I can say that I actually do very much respect Muslims and Islam, and I do recognize the fact that we have an enormous amount of agreement. But, you know, don't live the as same. Someone, again, as somebody who lives in a diverse community, like living among people, I mean, the, but the differences in culture and custom and, in, and also core values, that's a huge gulf. And, for, and, and living among different people like that is a qualitatively different life than living among people who see things very similar to you and have a similar cultural background. And, you know, and, the Putnam effect is real. And if you live among people who are radically different than you, you know, there's, it's going to feel more isolated. It's going to feel less thick. And, and, you're, and, and, and your children going forward are also going to have a more difficult time uh, developing sort of a collective identity that they can share with other people. These are barriers. We have to respect these barriers. And, you know, some people are going to want to live in these more uncertain areas, and some people are going to want to live in more solid areas. And I, I keep on feeling like a broken record because I want to emphasize this. I think both of these desires are legitimate. And, I and that's the, I don't uh, think... I don't think everyone has to live in areas where there's radical shifts in culture from one from one from one place to another. I think people who who want see there's a difference between wanting a homogeneous culture and a difference between wanting ho things homogeneous racially. And I think that there's a Martin Bailey that get played by the people who want homogeneous racial things with the people who want homogeneous culture and homogeneous religion. I think this is a Martin Bailey that goes on, and I think that Martin Bailey is a lot of what liberals are afraid of when they start getting into those kind of conversations around ethnicity, because ethnicity blurs all three of those boundaries in some way. So, but I would add that again, 
if you construct a liberal society and you do it properly and you do it slowly, most of the second and third generation Muslim kids that I know listen to the same music that I do. They cheer for the same sports teams I do. They write a lot of the same poetry or read a lot of the same poets as I do. They have a lot of the same assumptions about life as I do. They and therefore they have lost a lot of their ancestral culture, which means they're separated from their parents and their grandparents. That is I, the well, problem. Well, see, well, like, he, that, well, that's the difficulty, live, right? But they, no, but they, but they live the with their parents and grandparents still. Okay, They're great, but they don't, they don't practice the same poetry. They don't listen to the same things they do. This is the exact thing that I'm pointing to, right? In, 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 or they in, listen in, to in both. cultures. Oh, come on. I mean, the thing is that there, this is a trade-off here that we need to respect. And I'm asking people to respect this. The, the idea that you can have the best of both worlds, there's a trade-off here. Do you live oh, in a more no, cohesive no, look, society? Yes, you yes. live in one that new lives... New cultures... New cultures are definitely going to form, and cultural advancement will occur, or, or in some cases, things will be left behind. Look, so this is going to set your chat off. I'm ethnically Jewish, but I'm a converted Pentecostal Christian. <laughs> Not, not, not my the chat. chat. Going... You, you, you might, you might realize that the, no, the, no, the, the God, so he's, both he's Godfathers, <laughs> yeah, God, okay. bo both, so, both founders of neo reaction are both Jewish. <laughs> okay, sorry, maybe I shouldn't say your chat. I was referring to Benjamin because it's his chat. I wasn't talking to you, Dave, so I apologize for that. Benjamin, no, 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 the but, chat, no, but I'm, but the I, chat I just want is you... going to go berserk over this because every time I talk about this, I get it berserk on Twitter. So I'm just saying, because people say, uh, mm. the memes will come in into my, into my mentions, um, some worse than others. I don't. There's part, certain parts of my ethnic Jewish heritage which dropped out by virtue of the fact that I became a Christian, i.e. Mm. I don't eat kosher. I have, sort of grandma, but I've had a couple of ham sandwiches in my time. Mm. Um, and that's a trade-off, sure. But it's not a disastrous trade-off unless your goal is to say, I, I require of my children that they listen to the same poetry and have the same music as I do. Because even then, the music advances and grows and changes over time. I mean, let's take a look at the guitar. Like, the Gibsons I have now are descended from, you know, lyres, which were made from tortoise shells. The music is going to advance anyway. You know, so are you saying clinging to any sort of... Endlessly. So are you saying that clinging to any sort of ethnic solidarity is, is fallacious? Because things change and grow. You shouldn't be concerned about losing or recovering or adhering to the past or having some sort of through line in connection to deep generations. I'm saying that your fundamental... If you want to be a Christian, as I am, then you're the fleeting presence of your of whatever culture you happen to belong to because the culture is one of the very few things which i will agree socially constructed and in some sense extraordinarily arbitrary on the product of circumstance hmm. that's not something which you're going to be able to build a foundational personal identity i build my identity on the rock of who christ is because that defines who i am and trying to find your identity or your solidarity or your place in the world inside of a culture which is ultimately fleeting and which in the in the senses that you have described can't be built on anything objective because you're not meaning a broadly christian culture which would include various ethnicities and different types of poetry you're getting right down into the particular modes of expression including art and none of that stuff is evil or bad in and of itself, but it isn't a place to build your identity. That's fleeting and arbitrary. Well, My identity, identity is built on who I am in relation to God. I strongly encourage people to do that, but I, hmm. I think that there, there is a dimension of ethnic particularity we have to respect, right? And, you know, I think that's because, I think that saying, like, obviously, I definitely believe that your relationship with God comes first, but then there's to say, like you know, there, there is a deeper identity than just like what chewing gum you like or you know what rock band you listen to. Yeah, I consider the stuff that I was raised around and sort of the deeper cultural heritage to be more important. I mean, it's obviously not as important as as my religious devotion, 
but I would put that in a separate category than just like consumer products. And I'd also believe that that more important secondary category would be something that I would want to hand down to subsequent generations and that I have a responsibility to hand down to subsequent generations. And, you know, I, I, I think that you know, in, the, in the Jewish example, you can see how both the worship and the culture are, are very, very closely intertwined, especially in Orthodox examples. And I'm not so sure that, you know, older peoples, peoples who came from pre-modern societies wouldn't have seen religious worship, while more important, still sort of hopelessly intertwined with this deep folk culture, for lack of a better word, that, that pertains to a specific peoples in a specific place. Yeah, but I don't think that the folk culture is the basis for any kind of long-term or important personal identity, because it is, I mean, the, the culture, the religious values, yes, of the Christian culture are important, and the religious truths are important. But look, I love this guitar. I play this guitar. It's fantastic. My son wants to learn music. I already know that because of the amount of wealth in the society and the amount of songs that we are able to produce, that the music that I like, a lot of the stuff from the 70s, Boston, um, Grand Funk Railroad, Pink Floyd, and a lot of the stuff I like from the 90s, the Gin Blossoms or Oasis, is not stuff that he's going to, gr to gravitate towards. The, the flat fifth, the that right there that blues note is fading out man that's we're losing that now like you never hear like like that uh, sure we don't hear that anymore it's dropping out but but i don't consider the culture to be threatened because that's fading away it was always going to the ascendancy of rock and roll was always going to be replaced by something else and rock and roll was a deep and important part of american culture it drove a lot but it's going to drop out eventually like everything else does and we can do things to conserve like well, i mean we have conservatories right now which teach that uh you know baroque piano stuff and that's fine but that's not a part of the mainstream culture anymore and to try and anchor your identity in the culture is a mistake you have to anchor your identity in something transcendent and that is the issue and i think that all of the people who are saying well i want yeah. to protect the culture and da, 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 da. i mean sure fair enough you want to be able to have a culture in which you can get i don't see this as mutually exclusive you... that's the thing right you now these things like these pop culture things these are very very transient i mean they, they won't even Link your father to your to, to son. I mean, this is this is what concerns me. And like, so is the only thing that's going to link father to son is going to be like uh, the the explicit religious doctrines that are you know, basically just the core Christianity. If the only thing that my son takes from me is who God is and who he is in relation to God, then I feel like I've done my job because he will know who Christ is. If I pass my son all of my culture from nickelodeon right down to the poetry but i don't give him christ i will consider myself to have lost i would say the same thing but i'm like if i give my no but i, I would say i would just i would pose it this way i'm obviously if i were to say if i give my son a belief in god it'd be better that i give him the belief in god and that he be poor than he be well off and get a good education and, and not have that but Ideally, I give him both the good education and God, right? Because I have a responsibility to pass on to him the best things that I know, and and part of the best things that I know are, are the thing are the elements of culture that, while secular, are more meaningful and more deep, and connect him to a long line of ancestors and a long line of posterity that he's a part of. I, I think that this this individualism thing, I think, is you know. I think you can be a devout religious individual, although I think maybe the time for that might be passing. Uh, but but I, I think it's kind of it's kind of weird to me, right? I mean, why wouldn't a heritage, a secular heritage, is like an education because it teaches, it, it allows him to, it gives him, it's a tool for him to interact with the world better, and it's not as eternally important as God, but is nevertheless a tool as as important as is understanding math or physics, in my opinion. 
And if you don't have that, you are as deprived as someone who doesn't understand math or physics. And 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 certainly, I'll I'll pass on certain things to him, like the things that he'll need to to pass on in the world. There will be secular truths he'll need to know, things like math and physics or whatever else. And then there will be other things which he'll also learn, which uh, um, will come from from the culture. Like I will teach him scales, whole note scales out of the Western tradition of music, because that's what I know. But if he decides to move in and take up the sitar and pull up all the micro scales, now mind you, Western music has micro scales too. I hate this example. I shouldn't have used it. Uh, we'll just use blues then, because because blues has micro scales, just like quarter bends, third bends, half bends, just like the Indian uh, scales do. <clears throat> um, I, I'll teach him all that, but I I also know that 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 old way of bending, like that Albert King style, is falling out of fashion. It's getting called boomer bends now, right? Because that's a very old style way to do things. And I'll, I'll teach him that so that he's got it, so that he's got his foundation. But if he goes in a completely different direction with it, if he if he for some reason he hears the music of, I don't know, Japanese people, or I mean, I think Steve Vai did an album of Bulgarian wedding music or something like this. Like if he hears that and decides to jump headlong into that because that's what speaks to him, I don't consider myself to have lost. I think that's fine. I don't need to reproduce the culture and and the particularities of 20th or 21st century Canadian and Saskatchewan life in him. I need to raise him with well, the would knowledge you feel, of those you feel things the same. because that's the society. Well, would you th okay, how about this? I'll, I'll change it. Let's say you're a Native American and you've got tribal customs, but you're also, you're also a Christian. You wouldn't feel that something is, wasn't lost if uh, all the people carrying on those indigenous traditions and those folk arts just decided to move to the suburbs and eat at McDonald's and do the ordinary pop culture stuff and they forgot all of their traditions that linked them back to the First Nations of North America? Nothing would be lost there? I think, I think, well, when you say nothing is lost, well, obviously what's lost is the Yeah, culture. would nothing be lost? Well, no, I'm not saying no, nothing Would nothing important lost. be lost? Would nothing important have been lost? Um, I don't think, I, I know what you're trying to ask me, and I think that nothing, how can I say this? I don't, I think that the cultures are, the inherently part anything that has transcendental value in the culture should be brought forward but the particularities of the culture of any particular culture are um how do i put it unless they're anchored to objective truth then their value is a social construct you've got to objectively anchor it to something i think i believe that there are transcendent particularities. I think there is elements of divinity that you can only see sitting in certain times in certain places with a certain cultural background and a certain language. And if you lose those cultural modes that will temporary as they are, you know, are particular to you, then that particular dimension will be in many ways lost and the the overall diversity of the human perspectives will be further constrained we have an enormous homogenization of human culture in the modern world and i think this is destructive to our overall imagination everyone consumes sure. the same fast food everyone listens to the same shitty pop music everyone watches the same marvel movies We've lost something. We've lost a different language to express the eternal divinity of God in. And that does not make God less, but it makes our no. imaginations as humans less sophisticated of him. But, but if you're living in a homogeneous culture, then all the people around you are all watching the same shitty movies and eating the same shitty food and listening to the same songs. It's just from a particular culture. If that's what, if your culture is a, 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 a homogenized culture... No, there's a difference between... So, so look, there's a, there's a difference between sort of the deeply ethnic environment that my grandmother grew up in in a village in Eastern Europe, and then the homogenized mass culture of McDonald's and Marvel movies. And, and I, I understand that, like rhetorically, you can say that there's the same thing because they're both like you can both apply the word homogenous to them, but they're so qualitatively different that it's kind of you know I, I have I find a hard time to put into words like how different they are. The difference that the difference that you're 
that you're you're pointing to only applies to someone who can step back and see the chiroscuro. From within any one of those cultures, all you'd see is homogeneity. The only way that you could understand the beauty of the diversity is if you can see the diversity. And you can't do that from no. an internally homogenous culture. You, no, right? the, benefit, the, benefits, the benefits are from being grounded inside the thing, not from stepping back and seeing the diversity. The, the, the beauty of the culture is felt internally to it, not stepping back and seeing like the variety of different things, right? For, for there was instance, a like two hundred dollars you... super chat that just popped up, and I want to I want to make sure that we don't ignore it. Can you put that yeah, super chat back? It was two hundred dollars. It was two hundred uh, something ARS. <laughs> Do we have to answer super chats it's... now? Um, we can I can't. Super, right? We, we can't get through them all. I'm waiting for a break it's in the conversation, but culture. you guys were like you guys were like born in the same like eternal womb of language and thought and. Uh, it's uh, what, what's it's that? What do they say about uh, what, what Schmidt? Identity. Schmidt Schmidt was railing against like the eternal discussion, wasn't it? Wasn't it Schmidt? Yeah. Well, yeah, Schmidt was railing against the eternal discussion. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, this is this yeah. is the, the eternal <laughs> discussion. I don't. I don't think that the that that you're you're saying you're talking about somebody needs to be grounded in their everyday life so that they can go about life in the world. This is a view of culture which treats culture like a sort of heuristic. Right? It's a decision tree. I can't approach the world with everything all at once coming to me. So I have to have something to prioritize what I'm going to do. And culture provides me an infrastructure in terms of communicating with people, how I interact with people. I'm not reinventing the wheel every time I go to the grocery store and talk to somebody new that I've never seen before. I have a heuristic. We speak the same language. We understand the same mores. We're generally involved in elevating the same ideas. We have similar cultural touchstones and things like that. Is that what you kind of have in mind when you say grounded in the culture? No, uh, not it's not similarity. I mean, we're more similar than we've ever been. What I'm talking about is there's a pattern of life and a continuity of life. You benefit from being in one of these old continuous cultures. Uh, you know, modern mass culture is it, it's homogenized in the sense that everyone has the same thing, but there's nothing that connects you in terms of tradition and ceremony to the person that came after them. And, and so, you know, the, the individual is autonomous and is able to kind of create themselves out of their desires for the moment, where, whereas in the thicker cultures, the desires of the moment are subsumed into, into a broader collective. And, and that's what I'm kind of pointing to as being the essential difference between these two things. I think it's something like this. If we're going to take guitar, there's been a tradition of guitar in, in America that goes back to at least Robert Johnson of blues music that has been refined by people who have been passing that tradition on and picking up the baton. And they continue to refine it and refine it and refine it and refine it and make it better and then expand and refine and expand and refine. And what you're saying is if we all just homogenize to pop music, all of that decades of refinement goes away. Yeah, I, that's a, you could put it that way, I suppose. Yeah, I, I mean, would, that's I mean, just a micro. Look what, what happened to music recently, right? I mean, music's been kind of. I feel like music's kind of been falling off a cliff recently, along with the rest of pop culture. It has been, and I was talking with somebody about this today that we've had a death of pop culture, and one of the reasons that we've had it. Well, we've talked about that a long time, but melodies are getting more the same. Melodies are being recycled. There's, I mean, new chord progressions, are, old chord progressions aren't being used in new ways, like cigarettes and alcohol by Oasis. That song comes from Bring It On by, um, oh, kitty, what's up? Wow. That comes from Bring It On by T-Rex, and that ref got taken by taken back home by Slade, and that goes back to Little Queenie by, I think it was Little Queenie by Chuck Berry, right? Like, all of this stuff gets handed on, but in each taste it gets renewed and gets used. We're not even doing that anymore. We're just recycling melodies and recycling chords and changing the words, and the words are getting more ethereal and saying less, and all of this is falling apart. And I agree with you this kind of lowest common denominator thing we want to have the most viral thing on TikTok, so it needs to sound like everything else is a problem it is the diminishing of it it doesn't allow for anyone to take any deep dive everything has to be a surface level that is a problem and i agree with you that it's a problem but i don't think that the solution to that is going to rely in trying to engage in this this sort of ethnic preservationism because i think that these things like i mean the, the american blues tradition or the north american blues tradition or the western tradition of guitar music 
comes exactly out of the mixing of country bluegrass and blues music and those things being intricately interwoven in various different ways so i don't think that that again multiculturalism does imply that you have multi cultures and that their cultures are different in ways which are matter and allow them to be different and the which global homogenization all of all the culture right? yeah they right. won't be everything just gets Most painted to airport gray yeah and everything gets painted to airport gray i have some sympathy for that what i want is actual multiculturalism meaning actually different cultures and yes i imagine both multicult both mixed spaces and homogenous spaces because i think that's that's the best way forward because what i see what i fear is an incredible contraction in diversity uh, if we're going to say that everybody who wants to be in a homogenous community is pursuing a futile endeavor of ethnic preservationism i guess i just don't see it that way i see people who want to preserve their and i'm you know i'm we're culture my family is a cultural nomad at this stage in our existence so i'm not practicing this but but i i deeply admire people who erect intentional communities that are homogenous to one culture and then try to pass that down through generations to me this is an admirable endeavor it's actually breaking from the mold of the global monoculture and i think that these kind of deviations and and, and homogenous patches are essential to any kind of creative process hmm. they're uh, as essential not, as the mixing is is the is is the preservation Gentlemen, yeah, I, I don't, I don't Wait, want hold to disagree. On. With let's, um, let's, uh, well, cool. can we do uh, closing <laughs> statements now? My bladder's the size of a. Sorry. I'll, so, so, oh, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my closing statement, and then Dave can have the last word. Okay. Okay. Uh, sure. Go ahead. And I, thank you both for I, joining me. Dave, this has been fascinating. The yeah, I'm sorry. Really, this is a little spicy, Ben. I, 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 <laughs> I just apologize. got off of a ban. You know that, right? We, we, had, okay. we, we were talking <laughs> about the boundaries for acceptable conversation. Of course, we were going to be talking about things like racism, and and no. all don't say other it. Don't stuff, say right? it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I won't right. say. I won't okay. say. It. <laughs> I I want I want to say that I have enjoyed, as Benjamin said, this short. Terse, laconic, terse, laconic, <laughs> concise conversation of, but between two men of few words. Um, <laughs> the the oh. the touch point of this conversation is going to be my slip about South Africa. That's the one that's actually going to get spun around the internet. My mistake. So don't worry about getting canceled. My mistake on that one. I don't know. I I misheard or something, and I I. I, I was thinking of the word neighbor in the wrong context, and I said the wrong thing. That's going to get spun out into the world. <laughs> oh, but don't, so worry, don't worry about that. So let's just ease your mind. So here it is. I think that the left has treated people as though they were, has treated countries like hotels, and the people like they're, they're just individual like Legos, and they can just be placed around and moved around for economic reasons, and they're just that countries are just transient. I don't buy that. But I also think that beneath all of the cultural stuff, which is surface level, there is a person and that people ought to be adjud adjudicated, judged, loved, hated, liked, disliked, and they should rise and fall on their individual merits. I don't think... I think that societies are such that... In order to join a society, you have to accept, you have to be able to become, to learn the culture and to participate in the culture. And then you can bring something to it. And maybe you can say, hey, look, I've got this thing to offer up. And then maybe you can add to it. I think that process needs to be slow. For me, the no enemies to the right thing is about, there's a certain group of people who, under the guise of what you are trying to say, or perhaps under the guise of other things, want to bring back and increase the salience of race, and in fact play a certain form of white identity politics when I reject all racial identity politics, whether my enemies do or not, whether the left does or not, I reject them. And so for me, I don't think... I, I think that there are certain traditions that we do need to hand down, 
but I think that we need to hand them down with an open hand and allow them, because if you hand them down frozen, they're dead. If they don't advance, if they don't evolve, if classical music stops evolving, it's gone. Rock and roll music stopped evolving in the 2000s, it's dead now. It has to evolve to keep living. Things have to. Rock guitar music used to evolve. It used to be that it was using all the latest technology. Once that stopped, it started to die. Things need to be able to evolve to grow. I don't deny that there has been a sort of homogenization of global taste around the lowest common denominator that can sell the most things to the most people from the most cultures and try and create a kind of airport gray of everything. I don't think that's good. But I don't think the solution to that is to try and bring back in, reify and increase racial salience or or try to turn to human biodiversity or race and IQ studies to try and find solutions to the problems that ail us. I think those are deep and egregious mistakes. I don't think that adopting the epistemology of postmodernism and critical theory is a solution. And as I fumbled through this conversation, slow as I have, and trying to understand as much as I have, I still can't shake the feeling that there's an unstable sort of base that's almost overly pragmatic in response to the tremendous cultural hegemony of the political left. And I want to avoid making the mistakes that they have. I think that there's a difference between adapting their tactics and adopting their principles. And when it comes to things like postmodernism and critical theory, that's adopting their principles. And so I would say we can have enemies to the right in those kinds of cases. I don't think I don't think we should go around canceling people and destroying their careers because they buy these things. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. If they're again setting aside the A chord thing, suppose somebody was teaching at a school and suppose they really were being horrendously racist and they wanted to bring racist ideas into the school and teach them, I think you'd have justification to fire them for that. Although I wouldn't, I don't think you could go around on a denounce this person or we'll fire you as well. The sort of a reverse of the McCarthyist ideology of the 60s. I don't think that's right either. But I do think that at a certain point, we have to be able to publicly criticize and draw boundaries of who we're willing to work with and why. Which ideas we're going to allow into the tent. And I think that we can draw those in along the lines of principles. And certain are more core than others. But I think that we have to be able to police the boundaries. Because if we don't, um, it just becomes an amorphous blob searching for power. And that's the place where interests and cults of personality arise and win. And I don't think that's good. So. Amen. I will agree with this in part that I want to emphasize here that I get what you're afraid of with the, with crude racial politics. Everyone has this fear of out of control racial politics, uh, uh, the politics of revenge and revenge killings and, and, and purity spiraling and, and all the horrors we remember from the 20th century and the 19th century and so on and so forth. I, I understand the fear of this. The, the problem I see is I understand this as being part of a natural thing, a natural state of chaos that people lapse into. And I also don't, what I really want to emphasize here is that the, the ideas that we arrive at sort of on the more radical side of things, they're attempts at solutions to these problems. I think Wokel sees all of these problems as being the product of sort of intellectual bad actors and you know there were a lot of bad actors but but really what was happening in my opinion was that sort of the the mask of an old christian order was slipping away that no longer fit from the death of god and in the wake of that all of these more primordial evil instincts came to the fore 
you know, the, the crude racial identity politics, uh, the bureaucratic backbiting, what have you. And, 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 and in all this, you know, I, I think what I really want to do is I really want to stand back and try to preserve what we know is good. I don't think, I, mean, I, I think that the, the issue we're having here I don't know if I want to go on the race angle or not. I'm having a hard time ending this. But the the issue I want to take on is, is confronting the state of modernity that's driving all of these problems. That state of modernity is a sort of deracinated individual that then latches on to political movements for the main point of their existence and then get sucked into this bureaucratic managerial apparatus. I think key to confronting this is embracing intentional communities that will probably be largely homogenous. And this will require a certain amount of openness to older ideas, which is why I don't want to shut the door on all previous attitudes that most people had prior to the 20th century. I think that the way to do this, you know, going forward is kind of a genuine desire to understand the core of what people were going for and what they desire. Most people who have a distinct idea of racial nationalism or ethnic nationalism, what they really want is they want to be part of a thick community that's intergenerational, that carries on a sense of their own nation and their own culture that's shared between the generations, to, mo to not be part of the global monoculture, and to have some distinctiveness so that you are different and have an identity that's not just yours individually, but that relies on a collective. I don't think that that desire is illegitimate. I don't think the desire to have a common genetic ancestry or a common cultural ancestry is illegitimate. And I don't think the desire to pass that down to your children is Ill illegitimate either. The fact that this can be used for, for sort of crude racism of the, of the kind that I think you're right to fear, that's a legitimate concern. But I don't want to throw out the, the the desire for a solid collectivity baby with the crude racial hatred bathwater. And so I feel that a certain amount of looseness and certain amount of tolerance is needed. And a different approach to politics. I think another problem here, too, is with this coalition-based politics, the way Wokel sees it, and I can't cover it here, I think it's fundamentally inaccurate because it imagines that there is some kind of neutral position, although you might not characterize it that way. And, and I think that this, more than anything else, is what's allowed uh, the problems that we all bemoan in terms of wokeness to occur. That this is sort of a natural process that extends from the death of God and the emergence of the managerial state, as, as James Burnham described it. And my only solution is to, is to come up with something separate and something that can try to survive a, a reset that we all know needs to happen. And the reason needs to be hard and needs to be fast. And whether that reset comes through a collapse due to the competency crisis or whether it's it's implemented by some kind of cesarean feature, the way that Charles Haywood talks about. No one knows the future. But in the wake of that reset, I want to have people doing a lot of different things, and I want to have people be interested in deep things that carry on in the long term and not just the ephemerals of individual choices. I only think that people who are deeply rooted in a collectivity intergenerationally, only those people will be the ones that survive modernity's eye of the needle. And that's why I'm so interested in making sure that we're tolerant and really understand what people's desires are when they say things that might appear to us as crude and racist. And I don't want to be part of destroying the good with the bad, which is why I think the no enemies to the right was initially developed by uh, I, th I don't know if it's Dr. Haywood. I almost feel like it is. I'll say Charles Haywood. But I'll, I'll make that my final statement. <laughs> well, thank you both for that. Um, I can't add anything to that because I'm just, um, I am the neutral institution so far as you guys are concerned tonight. <laughs>
Thank you both for your time. Uh, the comments are going to be really amazing. Thank you, chat, for everybody who joined in and uh, pitched in. Uh, really appreciate to be back on the channel. I'm going to end it now. You guys want to say goodbye? Wave. Uh, bye, guys. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. <laughs>